Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we're proud to present to you guys the second year of the Clone Wars in chronological order. We're going to be talking about all the major battles, all the political intrigue, and hopefully that will prepare us somewhat for the seventh season of the Clone Wars. Enjoy. Chapter 1, The Blue Shadow Virus When your entire military is made up of droids and machines, and your enemy's military is completely made up of organic beings, the use of biological and chemical weapons will most likely come up in the weekly military planning session, especially when you're facing a clone army that has literally no genetic diversity. Later on in the war, the Separatist Alliance would actually develop a special virus that targeted only the FET DNA, and would leave humans and other sentient beings relatively unharmed. It's a small price to pay to end a war, or so a bad scientist would say. The idea of scientists, and especially doctors, creating viruses and diseases to kill people is especially troubling for us here on Earth, because doctors around the world usually swear to one version or another of the Hippocratic Oath, which basically states that they will do no harm. This is why we have issues with doctors performing euthanasia on patients or administrating lethal injections in an execution trial. In Star Wars, similar oaths have been sworn by doctors, depending on which era. Interestingly enough, during the Old Republic, doctors would venture out to the battlefield without any weapons and only focus on healing people. It was highly frowned upon by both sides of any battle to kill these individuals. But Star Wars has always had its fair share of mad scientists and very sketchy doctors. Like Pigface over here. He was a cosmetic surgeon, as you can tell, got too creative, and then lost his license. There was also another doctor named Nuvo Vindi, a false scientist employed by the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The fact that Dr. Vindi is an alien should tell us already not to trust him. But believe it or not, at one point in time, he was a relatively normal doctor who held the title of senior medic on the world of Adana. But somewhere around 31 BBY, he disappeared from the face of the galaxy and then suddenly reappeared in 21 BBY when Republic Senator Padme Amidala stumbled on his secret lab on Naboo. See, Dr. Vindi had created a secret underground testing facility on the planet where he was attempting to revive a very terrifying disease known as the Blue Shadow Virus. In its natural form, the Blue Shadow Virus was a waterborne illness, and in ancient times, it spread across the galaxy, killing millions of people. The virus was relatively quick-acting, and within 48 hours of contact, the virus could kill a host. It also had a ridiculously high mortality rate of 96% when it encountered carbon-based life forms. That's even higher than extremely deadly diseases like Ebola here on Earth. A cure was eventually found for the Black Shadow Virus, but we're going to talk about that later. Now, because of the virus's waterborne nature, it was eventually quarantined and killed off. And at least until 21 BBY, the Blue Shadow Virus was basically extinct, existing only in medical records and perhaps one or two labs that were highly guarded. Much like how the smallpox virus is kind of extinct here on Earth, it was a disease that killed an estimated 300 million people in the 20th century alone, roughly three times the number of people killed in all wars combined during that same time. Time. But Dr. Vindi was a crazy bastard and saw the beauty in such a complicated and deadly virus. And not only sought to reanimate the virus, he also made it airborne, making it 10 times deadlier and harder to contain. Although why he made the virus visible in a blue gaseous form is also kind of odd. Perhaps that was his way to warn people that a deadly virus is coming? Probably not. Anyway, Padme Amidala and Sith Lord Jar Jar Binks are on their homeworld investigating sightings of a Separatist droid scouting party. The war had yet to reach the peaceful planet, but the events of the Naboo invasion only a decade ago made the planet's security forces extra vigilant about another droid attack. A tactical droid had been captured by the Naboo security forces, which led Padme and Jar Jar to investigate a part of the eastern swamps of Naboo. Padme contacts her boo and his master, Obi-Wan Kenobi, for backup in case things get a bit difficult. While searching, the Republic team encounters a group of dead shocks, domesticated herding animals. They had been drinking water from a nearby river, which led Padme to conclude that the water was tainted. This was a part of Dr. Nuvo Vindi's first trial run of the virus in its natural waterborne form. Eventually, Padme and Jar Jar come across the secret entrance for Dr. Vindi's lab and are immediately surrounded by droids and captured. Padme learns about the Good Doctor's plan to create an airborne version of the Blue Shadow Virus. He's also made them into gas bombs, which would be deployed to populated Republic systems across the galaxy. All of a sudden, the stakes just got higher. 
Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi arrive to the planet with a squad of Republic troopers, including a bomb squad. They breach the Separatist lab and attempt to neutralize the Separatist forces within the compound and are able to capture Dr. Nuvo Vindi before he can escape or release the virus. But as Obi-Wan and Anakin prepare to take the Separatist doctor to Bimbu, Republic forces find that one of the blue shadow virus bombs are missing. One of Vindi's droids has stolen it and sets it off in the underground bunker, with several clone troopers, Padme, Jar Jar, and Ahsoka still inside. To make matters worse, there are still droids inside the bunker who are attempting to break out. The Republic forces trapped inside valiantly try to stop the droids and are successful, but most of them become infected by the blue shadow virus in the process. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin, and Dr. Vindi return to Theed, where they meet Captain Typho. Luckily, he's found a cure for the blue shadow virus, a plant known as the Rixo root. But it was an incredibly rare plant and could only be found deep in separate space on the planet of Ego. With most fatalities happening only 48 hours after the exposure to the Blue Shadow Virus, Anakin and Obi-Wan have no choice but to rush to Ego and find the root. Ego is a temperate and tropical world on the outer edge of the Outer Rim. It had many moons, which is why it was also called the World of a Thousand Moons. Also orbiting the planet was a massive graveyard of ships. Upon landing on the planet, Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi are able to quickly find the root. But when they try to leave, they find out from the inhabitants of the planet that leaving was a lot tougher than landing on the planet. Most of the locals have been trapped on Ego for many months. They explain to the two Jedi that after the Separatists left the planet, a phantom in the sky named Droll had destroyed anyone attempting to leave. More than 50 pilots had attempted to leave and they all had perished. But after scouting the debris field above the planet, Obi-Wan theorizes that the Separatists have deployed a defense grid above the planet, which stops anything from leaving. The two are desperate to get off the planet as the Republic Task Force trapped in Dr. Vindy's lab are running out of time. While meeting with the inhabitants of Ego and discussing their next course of action, an angel approaches the Jedi. Remember in episode one when Anakin asked Padme if she's an angel? Well, that's what he meant. Angels were an alien species that had been living on one of Ego's moons before the Separatists arrived and kicked them off the planet. The Jedi come to a conclusion that the defense grid is most likely being controlled from that moon. And they're correct. The Jedi managed to destroy the defense system, allowing them to leave the planet and freeing all the people trapped there as well. Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi reach Naboo just in time to save the Republic Task Force, who had valiantly stayed behind to prevent the virus from spreading. Dr. Vindy's virus is destroyed and he's taken back to Coruscant where he'll spend the rest of the war. And most likely where he'll be recruited by the Empire's Weapon Research Program after the rise of the New Order. Chapter 2, The Battle of Ryloth. In many ways, Ryloth was like the Poland of the Star Wars galaxy, full of good, hard-working people, but constantly being exploited and turned into a battlefield by its much more powerful neighbors. Of Ryloth have suffered due to their lack of resources and industries on their world. This was due to the general roughness of their planet. Ryloth was covered in diverse biomes, ranging from jungles to deserts, giant valleys nestled in between active volcanoes. At its equator, a massive forest circumvented the planet, and was full of some of the largest and nastiest predators you could imagine, many of them roaming around in giant packs and swarms. Combine that with deadly storms and terrifying winds, it's not surprising that most Twi'leks lived underground in caves. Despite joining the Republic as early as 10,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, Ryloth's close proximity to Hut space and far distance from the core Republic worlds meant that it was constantly being exploited by the Hut criminal cartels. The Twi'leks were oftentimes kidnapped and forced into slavery, either as sex workers or spice miners. In the first year of the Clone Wars in 22 BBY, Ryloth and nearby systems like Geonosis, Christophus, Batuai, and Rhodia were targets for the Confederacy of Independent Systems' rapid territorial expansion. Ryloth was one of the first planets occupied during the war, and we talk in depth about it in our first year of the Clone Wars history series. But let's do a quick recap of what happened. Because of Ryloth's extreme location at the very end of the Gamora Run trade route, the majority of Republic Navy resources were directed to worlds that were closer to the core of the galaxy. Ryloth only had a small detachment of clones, along with the Jedi General, Ima Gundy. The Republic forces there were allied with Champ Syndulla and his Twi'lek resistance, and they were under siege by a large Separatist storage army under the command of Techno Union Emir Wat Tambor. The Separatists had blockaded the planet and were slowly starving the local populace. You see, Ryloth had very limited agricultural production, and it imported most of its food, medicine, and other basic goods. Its only exports were real spice and slaves. 
Ultimately, the Republic garrison was overrun, and Jedi General Ima Gundi and all of his forces were slaughtered. But their sacrifice was not in vain, as their last stand allowed the Twi'lek resistance to evacuate the area, along with a considerable amount of Twi'lek civilians. Republic blockade runners also had managed to bring emergency supplies to the Twi'leks, allowing them to survive a bit longer. With the last pocket of Republic forces destroyed, Separatist forces occupied the planet and maintained a blockade over Ryloth. Wat Tambor, a member of the Separatist High Council, oversaw the occupation from the capital city of Lesu. Cham Sandula's resistance fighters had melted into the wilderness and were still carrying out asymmetrical attacks against Separatist positions. But they had very little effect on the overall occupation. The entire planet is now under Separatist control. Recent Separatist defeats at the Battle of Batawai and the destruction of the Separatist Dreadnought Malevolence has given Republic forces some breathing room, which meant that they could finally focus some resources on retaking Ryloth. But first, they have to get past the Separatist blockade commanded by the talented Nemoidian Captain Martuk. Captain Martuk was a student of military history and an admirer of General Anakin Skywalker. Having studied the Jedi General carefully, he had devised the cunning strategy to oppose the coming invasion. The Republic forces approached the system with three Venator class Star Destroyers, the Defender, the Redeemer, and the Resolute. Admiral Wolf Yolren commands the ships, while Anakin Skywalker leads their overall operation. It's imperative that the Republic forces break through the blockade. Obi Wan Kenobi and Mace Windu are waiting in hyperspace for an opening to launch their ground forces. Despite this being a very high-risk operation, Anakin decides to place his Padawan learner in charge of Blue Squadron. Ahsoka Tano has proved herself as a combatant and pilot, but she has very little experience in command. This will be a big test for her. Upon approaching the system, the Republic fleet finds the Separatist blockade waiting for them above the planet. Captain Martuk's command ship is the Lucre Hulk battleship, and he's flanked by two magnificent star frigates. The Lucre Hulk battleship was quite a formidable ship at 3,000 meters in diameter. It was three times the size of a Venator class and bristling with weapons and placements. It also served as a troop and star fighter carrier. But it should be noted that the Lucre Hulk was originally designed as a cargo ship and not for military use. The Munificent class Star Frigates, despite being close in size to the Venator class Star Destroyer, had far less armor and weapons on board. So both sides were actually pretty evenly matched. Anakin sends Ahsoka Tano's Blue Squadron, made up of a dozen or so V-19 torn starfighters, to probe the Separatist formation for any weaknesses. The Venator class Star Destroyers, while weakly armed, had a massive amount of starfighters inside of them, which they usually used to screen, attack, and defend their forces. A smart Venator captain always engaged an enemy force from afar, keeping their starfighters in between them and their enemy. Blue Squadron quickly cuts through a formation of Vulture droids and is about to pull within weapons range of the enemy command ship. This is when Captain Martuk springs his trap and calls in reinforcements from hyperspace. Four additional Munificent class frigates appear on the flanks of the Separatist formation and begin their own offensive against the Republic fleet. Wolf Yolren and Anakin quickly call Blue Squadron back, but Ahsoka, being the inexperienced commander that she is, has tunnel vision and is only focused on engaging the enemy command ship. She doesn't notice that the majority of her squadron has been destroyed and the enemy forces are closing in on her. And when she finally turns back, her attack is already too late. Without Blue Squadron protecting the Venator Star Destroyers, the Republic ship's defenses and shields are quickly overwhelmed. The Redeemer is far too damaged to move, and a wing of Vulture droids launch a kamikaze attack against the Resolute, destroying its bridge and almost killing Admiral Wolf Yolren. The Republic forces are forced to retreat. It's a devastating defeat, but the Republic forces aren't completely done yet. Ahsoka is reprimanded by Anakin for disobeying orders, but he also recognizes that a part of her rebellious spirit mostly came from his own teachings. Instead of removing her from command, though, Anakin gives Ahsoka full command of the next invasion, which is really the last thing you would expect. But Commander Tano comes up with a brilliant, if not unethical, plan. She evacuates the heavily damaged Defender of all personnel and has Anakin Skywalker pilot it all by himself and surrender to the Separatist blockade. In exchange for a surrender, the Separatists would allow food and medical supply convoys to reach the surface of the planet. Captain Turk, perhaps momentarily blinded by his success, agrees to the terms, but he's horrified to find that the Republic is using the white flag of truce in order to get the damaged defender close enough to his command ship to ram it. Which is exactly what happens. This is completely immoral and against most rules of engagement for almost any culture here on Earth. The white flag is a sacred symbol, and the use of this sacred symbol to attack an enemy will jeopardize all future Republic forces who actually do want to surrender. As a matter of fact, Obi-Wan Kenobi pulls off the same move during the Battle of Christophus. 
It clearly shows us that the Jedi have no clue on how to conduct themselves in a battle. Anyway, the Defender slams into the Separatist command ship, destroying it. Meanwhile, Commander Tano brings the Resolute within firing range. She adjusts the ship so that the bottom of the destroyer is facing the remaining Separatist fleet and launches all of our own fighters from the shielded side of her ship, outside the view of the remaining Separatist ships. The Y-Wings are able to outflank the blockade and make quick work of the remaining Munificent class Star Frigates, paving the way for Obi-Wan Kenobi and Mace Windu's ground troops to start a ground invasion. Because Ryloth is sparsely populated, most of the Separatist forces are concentrated around population centers. The Republic's main goal is to prevent civilian casualties and seize Wat Tambor and the capital of Lasu. The Republic forces choose to concentrate the majority of the forces on the city of Nabat first. Nabat was chosen as the landing point because they had large fields large enough for the Acclimator-class assault ships. It was also within reasonable distance of the capital of Sioux, and it was also rumored that the Twi'lek resistance forces were in the area. The Separatist forces on the ground had several batteries of proton cannons, which were able to heavily damage one of the Acclimator-class assault ships when they were approaching the surface. This forces the Republic to withdraw their landing ships. Instead, they send a small unit of clone troopers on gunships to the ground, led by Obi-Wan Kenobi. Their main mission is to take out the Separatist AA guns and clear a path for the invasion force. The clone army was under strict guidelines to not use explosives to limit civilian casualties and damage to the Twi'lek cities. After encountering heavy defense on the outskirts of the city, Kenobi and Commander Cody managed to breach the Separatist defenses and enter the city, which is completely abandoned. Obi-Wan Kenobi sends a small squad of clones to scout ahead, and sure enough, they find all the civilians inside the city being held hostage by the droid commander TX-20. After studying Republic tactics, the droid commander realizes that the Republic will not attack his position as long as innocent civilians are nearby, so he uses the local Twi'leks as human shields. I mean, Twi'lek shields. The Cyprus commanders also send a group of local monsters known as Gut Cars, which manage to take out several clones. Ultimately, the clones carry out a frontal assault on the Separatist position at the center of the town and take out the AA gun positions and save most of the hostages. This finally opens up the landing fields around the city and Mace Windu and the rest of the Republic invasion force arrives as well. Using the bot as a staging ground, Commander Pons and Mace Windu lead an armored column towards Lissu. Along the way, the Republic are forced to enter a narrow canyon where they are ambushed by Separatist hover tanks. But using ATRT's Mace Windu leads Lightning Squad, a small recon unit on an epic charge against the droid forces, and manages to take them out before the Republic tank column is destroyed. The Republic forces continue to push on until they finally meet up with Twi'lek resistance fighter Cham Syndulla. Although the Jedi and Republic forces had formally sacrificed their lives to help his movement survive, Syndulla was still suspicious of the Republic's motives. After all, they had left them under Separatist control for almost a year. But when Syndulla finds out that the Separatists had begun firebombing Twi'lek villages in retaliation for the Republic invasion, Syndulla finally agrees to march on the Ryloth capital of Lesu with Republic forces. Watanbor, sensing things were near the end for his occupation, begins scrambling across the planet and seizing treasures and goods he had taken from the Twi'leks there. Mace Windu and Syndulla's army finally emerges on the outskirts of Lesu and manage to charge over the energy bridge and make it into the city. Watan Bor has stayed far too long trying to gather riches and was captured and unconditionally surrenders to the Republic. Chapter 3 Battle of Pollution The Battle of Ryloth ended in the defeat of Watan Bor and all the Separatist forces on the planet. It shows us that despite the fact the Separatists outnumbered the clone troopers across the galaxy, whenever a Republic army was led by a well trained group of Jedi Knights, things would usually go in their favor. And the Republic had far more Jedi generals than the Separatists had good commanders. Sure, you had standouts like Admiral Trench, but most Separatist fleets and armies were led by commander droids who were very predictable. Shortly after the Battle of Ryloth ended, the Battle of Baypor erupted in the Naboo system. A Ska Cohen named Kulteska had started stirring up some trouble on the planet. He was formerly a well-respected scientist working for the Techno Union, but a freak accident occurred while he was wearing his pressure suit, which almost killed him and left his body disfigured. In order to function and move around, Colteska built himself a cybernetic suit. The scientist enjoyed the power his new suit gave him, and he began bolting all sorts of attachments and weapons to his body, and would eventually become a mercenary. Colteska then invented a gravity polarization beam. This was a super weapon which could rip things apart at the atomic level. 
Koltesko wanted to use this weapon to destroy Naboo's son in order to impress Count Dooku. Padme Amidala, who is recently in Naboo investigating the Blue Shadow virus, journeys to Bayport to investigate what the hell is going on and is captured once again. Upon finding out about Tesco's plan, the Republic is forced to launch an assault on his facility. Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano end up engaging Koltesko in battle, while Padme sabotages the superweapon and causes it to destroy itself. Once again, disaster is averted in the Naboo system. Elsewhere, the Battle of Atrican was finally winding down. The planet Atrican was an extremely rich source of dunium. Dunium was a heavy metal used for ship construction. Separatist forces had taken control over the mining operation there and had fortified their positions. When the GAR arrived to dislodge them, the two sides were quickly weighed down into a stalemate. The Separatist forces on the planet resorted to using biochemical weapons. While the GAR was prepared to encounter such weapons, the civilian populace was not. After a year of fighting, the Republic finally managed to dislodge the Separatist forces on the planet, but the victory came at a great cost. 90% of the civilian populace had been either killed or displaced. Battles like this one began really shaking the morale of the Republic civilian populace, and it started making a lot of people wonder whether the Clone Wars was actually worth it. Shortly after these two battles, the Republic began planning an invasion of the planet Felucia. Like Ryloth, Felucia was another world located in the Adarim territories, just a jump or so away from Yavin. Like most worlds in this part of the galaxy, it had a pretty sparse population of only around 8.5 million settlers. Most of these colonists had settled on the planet looking to take advantage of the world's many rich resources. What made Volusia unique was that it was covered in giant mushroom forests. The world was incredibly hot and humid and bathed in ultraviolet light from its nearby star, and the plants, fungal life forms, and creatures all had a deeply symbiotic relationship, creating a perfectly balanced ecosystem. Many of the plants and fungi on the world were only unique to Felucia, and they also had very complex chemical and biostructures which made them very useful as drugs and medicine. One of the more popular herbs that could be domesticated and farmed on the planet was known as Nicelin. Nicelin had very good healing qualities and was widely sought after throughout the entire galaxy. Other than back to very few drugs or chemicals had the same effect as Nicelin. While these kind of healing herbs were less important for a droid army like the one the Separatist army sent at the battle, denying such a world to the Republic was of great strategic benefit for the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Earlier in the war, the Separatists had destroyed a Republic medical facility orbiting Felucia. It had been made to take advantage of the bountiful resources on the planet, all of which was harvested by small communities and independent farmers. It was a part of the CIS's original attempt to take control of the Adarim away from the Republic. It wasn't until now that the JR had resources to retake the planet. Felucia was an interesting, if not difficult, world to wage battle on. The gigantic mushroom forest definitely served as a unique battlefield to fight in. Republic colonists had a really difficult time taming the world and very little of the planet was actually developed thanks to the sheer tenacity of the local flora and fauna. Even making the smallest clearing in the mushroom forest was a pretty difficult thing to do. If the gigantic mushrooms and carnivorous bacteria didn't get to you, the accolades definitely will. Therefore, most battles between the Republican Separatists were fought at close ranges in heavily forested areas. The Republican invasion forces found movement pretty difficult, and even with Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, and Ahsoka Tano leading them, they soon became surrounded by the Separatists, whose numbers were much higher than the Republic first anticipated. On top of that, a Separatist fleet of several munificent star frigates, along with a Recusant light destroyer, had blockaded the planet, preventing any reinforcements from coming and preventing Republic forces from leaving the planet. The Recusant class light destroyer was an interesting ship, not as commonly seen as the munificent and Providence class warships of the CIS Navy. Also known as the Commerce Guild destroyer, this ship was anywhere from 1.2 kilometers to 2.5 kilometers long. Like most Separatist ships, the Recusant was heavily automated and only required a tiny crew of 300. In comparison, the Republic Venator class Star Destroyer, which was around the same size, had a crew of over 7,000 clones. The Recusant's basic systems were operated by a droid brain. The low number of crew also meant that the ship was relatively skeletal in nature, requiring very few areas with life support or oxygen. Its cargo space was mainly full with fuel cells, weapon systems, and over 40,000 battle droids. 
Although more formidable than a munificent class star frigate, the recusant class light destroyer was still considerably weaker than a Venator class star destroyer. Meanwhile, back on the surface, the Republic's recent string of victories had made their forces a bit overconfident, and the Republic forces under the command of Anakin and Obi-Wan finally run out of places to go and are forced to circle the wagons and fortify their position. While the all-terrain tactical enforcers and turbo tanks served as great weapons platforms and even forward operating bases, they weren't as effective in the close-range mushroom jungle fighting on Felucia. Their large size also meant that the clones were forced to stay in more clear areas with less coverage. The Separatists, meanwhile, were able to send waves and waves of super battle droids and dwarf droids to pin them down. Separatist tanks were also slowly closing in on their position behind the Separatist droids and they were about to be overrun. Were I in charge of this Republic task force, I would probably abandon the vehicles and then just fade into the forest. But the Republic had another plan. They called in reinforcements, or more accurately, a rescue party to take them away from the planets. So they'll need to stay near a clearing so that the gunships can come and pick them up. In orbit, Jedi Master Plo Koon arrives with three Benedict class Star Destroyers along with his 104th Battalion. Plo Koon was probably one of the best pilots in the Jedi Order, easily as good as Anakin Skywalker and perhaps a little better. While his capital ships engaged the Separatist blockade, he personally led a starfighter escort and a group of gunships past the Separatist blockade down to the surface. While under heavy fire from Separatist vulture droids, the gunships land in the clearing aside the surrounded Republic forces. Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi call for a fighting retreat towards the gunships, but once again Ahsoka Tano fails to listen to the order and stubbornly remains fighting while standing on top of a giant turbo tank. Once again, she has tunnel vision just like during the Battle of Ryloth, and she doesn't see the larger picture of the battlefield around her. She's completely unaware that the droids retreating in front of her were a part of a feint designed to lead her forces into a trap. Separatist droids were now closing in on their position from all directions. Obi-Wan Kenobi finally talks some sense into the Padawan, and they manage to extract her before it's too late. Once again, Ahsoka Tano has taken after her master, perhaps a little bit too much. Anakin was famous for disobeying orders during battles, perhaps finally seeing his own behavior in his Padawan will force him to grow up a bit. Back at the temple, the Jedi Council reprimand the young Padawan just a few weeks before Ahsoka had done the same thing during the Battle of Ryloth, after she led her squadron of starfighters into a trap, leaving a Republic cruiser defenseless. Admiral Wolf Yolaren had been severely hurt by the attack. Anakin steps up as a master should and takes responsibility for his Padawan's actions. After all, he is the one training her. In many ways, Ahsoka and Anakin were a perfect match for each other. They had similar character flaws, which they saw in each other, which helped grow their own self-awareness about those flaws. Felucia would remain a contested planet for the rest of the war, and in 19 BBY, the 182nd Legion would be sent to retake the world, but soon after, lost contact with Republic Central Command. The 501st would be sent a month later, and they found out that the entire 182nd had been wiped out. The conditions on the planet were terrible. Along with fighting the Separatists, the clones suffered heavy casualties from attrition and disease. It was only because of the leadership of Jedi General Ayala Secura that the 501st would survive their mission to the planet. But ultimately, the clones would go on to turn against their general during Order 66. Chapter 4, Stealing Jedi Babies. After disobeying orders for the second time in a month, Ahsoka Tano is taken off the front lines by the Jedi Council. Probably a wise decision. Ahsoka has already almost killed herself several times along with several other clones and at least one admiral. She means well, but she's clearly way too young for the battlefield. Masters, this incident is my responsibility. Because of Ahsoka's advanced abilities, I forgot how young she is. I gave her more freedom than I should have. If a girl as young as Ahsoka Tano was fighting here on Earth, it would definitely be a violation of the Geneva Convention. And the Jedi would be prosecuted for war crimes. But what do we know? We're primitive people, right? Anyway, Mace Windu and Yoda decided to temper the Padawan by assigning her guard duty in the Jedi archives. And yes, that's even more boring than it sounds because no one attacks a library inside of a Jedi temple. Still, it's a good opportunity for Ahsoka to have some mentorship under someone besides Anakin. The Jedi Knight means well, but he and Ahsoka suffer from the same problems. They're both too skilled and things come way too easy to them. That makes them impulsive and impatient. Master Jocosa knew the head librarian is basically the opposite of that. 
The Jedi Archives are not only a library, but sort of a giant safe for all the treasures, trinkets, and artifacts the Jedi Order has collected over the years. And this rendition of the Jedi Temple has stood untouched since it was sacked by the Sith Empire almost 4,000 years ago. The archives are full of millions of documents, hollow vids, and holocrons, which contain tons of information, some of it forbidden, and others widely taught to the Jedi Order. The head of security for the archives was tasked with keeping these documents safe. Most of the time, this just meant preventing over-curious Padawan from accessing dark side manuscripts and journals. But then again, not even the master librarian knew where everything was. If you're getting a Harry Potter vibe right now, so am I. But fortune would have it that on this particular day when the Jedi Council decide to assign a very talented Padawan to guard the archives, a very talented thief and bounty hunter by the name of Cad Bane was also interested in robbing the archives. The Duros had been hired by none other than Darth Sidious to break into the archives to steal a particular holocron. Holocrons were these crystalline items that the Jedi and Sith used to record knowledge and lessons on. Some holocrons, especially Sith ones, could even trap the essence or soul of the writer within it. This is why Sith holocrons were considered pretty dangerous, especially for an untrained young Padawan. The holocrons were relatively secure data storage devices. It usually required force powers to access the information inside. Sometimes you would also need a kyber crystal key to open it after you actually open it with the force. Cad Bane was after a very, very special holocron. You see, the Jedi Order in canon kept information of all potential Force users in the galaxy on one holocron. They did this by using federal medical records. Usually there were blood tests done that could show what a person's midichlorian levels were. If they had levels that were high enough, they would be flagged. Also, sometimes the Jedi Council would come together and collectively meditate and try to find Force users across the galaxy, a la Professor X. The Holocrons was sort of a Rolodex of sales leads, but instead of making sales, Jedi Seekers would use these leads to steal, I, I mean, uh, recruit Force-sensitive babies to their cause. Darth Sidious, aka Chancellor Palpatine, as the elected leader of the Republic, had a responsibility to recollect these Force-sensitive babies and then surgically alter them and turn them into dark side assassins. So it was out of the frying pan onto the lava planet for these babies. But Cat Bane wasn't stupid, he didn't immediately take this job because he knew it was almost impossible to break into a Jedi Temple. Being a security guard for the Jedi Archives is boring because only a complete fool would ever think of breaching the temple. First, you have to get past the local Coruscant police guarding the outside of the temple. During more tense periods, even clone troopers might be deployed outside the temple for extra security. Inside the temple were the Jedi Temple Guards. These were anonymously selected Jedi Knights who devoted their lives to defending the Order. They definitely could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Sith Lord, so facing a bounty hunter, even one as skilled as Cad Bane, probably wouldn't be a huge problem for them. Along with that, there were tons of special locks and security devices within the temple that could only be triggered by the Force. So it comes to no surprise that Cad Bane had a long list of demands for Darth Sidious, including asking for triple the pay, along with a very special and expensive Rogue-class Starfighter. Manufactured by Bactoid Armor Workshop, these were the preferred Starcrafts of the Magna Guard droids. Cad Bane's version of the ship was supposed to be specially equipped with a cloaking device and special weapons package. Very people ever demanded anything from Darth Sidious and survived, let alone got what they actually wanted. Cad Bane happened to be one of those people, he was skilled enough at his job to not die. Palpatine also had an entire blueprint and map of the building, along with a security chip that could hack into the Jedi Temple's security system. The bounty hunter's team consisted of his helper droid Toto 360, who he equipped with a bomb, and another bounty hunter, Kato Parasiti, who was a shape-shifting Claudite. Bane had been tipped off by Palpatine about an old Jedi Master who had been fighting in the Outer Rim named Master Innocence. Bane had murdered the Skrilling Jedi and now Kato could take his form and voice by touching his corpse and could walk right through the temple's front door as a Jedi Master. Toto 360 would help Bane infiltrate the Jedi Temple's ventilation system, but they still needed someone inside the temple to help them out. Everything goes smoothly for the Claudite until she enters the archives, where she encounters an overly bored Padawan looking desperately for something to do. Like a lot of people on their first day of work, Ahsoka Tano was just trying to be as helpful as possible. Which really annoys Master Innocence and makes him snap at her. Which is actually a very un-Jedi thing to do. Odd that Ahsoka can't sense that Innocence was actually Kato, perhaps the shapeshifter also could mask themselves in the Force. 
which definitely makes her shape-shifting power a lot more intense than just the polyjuice potion. Meanwhile, Yoda senses a disturbance in the force, intruders are trying to break into the temple. This was just another layer of security that we haven't mentioned yet. Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi think that the intruders are after the communication codes in the Jedi communication tower. With these codes, the Separatists would be able to predict all of the Republic's movements. Meanwhile, Innocence has reached the archive computers, helps Toto and Bane infiltrate the temple through the ventilation shaft, and helps them navigate a series of obstacles. But then head librarian Joe Casanu interrupts the shapeshifter, questioning why he was working when the temple was in high alert. The Klondike quickly reacts and knocks out Joe Castanu, taking her form. Anakin and Obi-Wan have now entered the ventilation and were on Bane's tail. They momentarily go the wrong way, thinking the intruders are still after the communication center. Yoda's senses are powerful. He's able to sense that the intruders are disguised as the head librarian and warns Ahsoka. So it is possible maybe for a powerful Jedi to see right through a Claudite's disguise. Ahsoka engages Jocasta in a duel and the bounty hunter is surprisingly good with the weapon and holds her own for a while, but she is ultimately captured by the Padawan. Kato confesses about what she was up to. Ahsoka warns Obi-Wan, Kenobi, and Anakin that Bane is after the holocrons. But Bane has set up a series of explosions, including one in his droid, which will serve as a great distraction and leads the Jedi to the communication center. Bane is able to break into the Holocron vault and makes it out of the Jedi Temple with a list of Jedi babies. Which was a really bad thing for the Jedi. Babies, like small dogs, are very easy to steal and then hide because they are small and weak. Kato proves to be the most mercenary bounty hunter ever and quickly alerts the Jedi to Bane's next plans. He's going to meet a Jedi named Bulu Rapol. The name quickly draws the attention from Mace Windu. Bulu Rapol is the keeper of the Kyber Crystal, which unlocks the holocron full of Jedi babies. Just to clarify, the babies are not physically inside the holocron. It's not like a Pokeball. It just has a list of where they might be. Bola Ropa is the keeper of the Kyber Crystal, which unlocks the holocron full of Jedi babies. Cad Bane tracks down Bola Ropa to Deveron and has managed to capture the Jedi Master and now is holding him hostage. But without a Jedi's force powers, the holocron still can't be opened and unlocked with the Kyber Crystal. Ropal valiantly refuses to open the holocron and ultimately is killed by Bane. But that was okay because Cad Bane had another plan. Anakin and his Padawan Ahsoka Tano were about to reach his new base. Bane knew that Anakin and Ahsoka were not like the average Jedi. They had a very close connection. The Jedi is far too noble to save themselves in order to open up a holocron, but they might have problems with sacrificing someone else's life for that holocron. Knowing this, Bane cuts Anakin off from Ahsoka and manages to stun the Padawan with some stun clefts he had hidden up his sleeves. Using Ahsoka as leverage, Cad Bane forces Anakin to open up the holocron. This is clearly one of Anakin's biggest weaknesses and it'll haunt him more and more as he grows older and develops more connections and emotional bonds with different people. Anakin is never willing to give up those who he loves, and in my opinion that makes him more of a man and a better person than most Jedi, but it's clearly against the Order's ideology. Cad Bane is able to escape again, this time disguised as a clone trooper wearing full armor. With a list of future Jedi babies in his possession, Lord Sidious tasks Cad Bane to hunt down the babies and take them back to a secret base on Mustafar. The Jedi Council once again used their immense power in the Force to look for disturbances and managed to isolate three Jedi babies they think the bounty hunter will target. Bane had already managed to take a Rodian baby from Coruscant, but the Jedi managed to reach a Gungan baby on Naboo before the bounty hunter can get there. When Bane finally arrives, instead of seeing a baby, he comes face to face with a very Ahsoka Tano who manages to capture him this time around. Bane is unwilling to tell the Jedi where he's taken the other babies. So Obi-Wan and Anakin use a very unethical technique and basically force the information out of him. It's similar to what Kylo Ren does to Poe Dameron in The Force Awakens. But I guess it's not evil when the good guys do it, right? Using Bane as a guide, the Jedi rush to Mustafar. Unfortunately, Skywalker reports to Palpatine about the kidnapping plot. Obi-Wan Kenobi had fought against revealing this information to the Chancellor. He considered this an internal Jedi issue, but ultimately Mace Windu overruled him and said it was probably a good idea to let the Chancellor know that someone was stealing babies in his Galactic Republic. This of course alerts Palpatine, who was in the process of conducting surgery on the Jedi babies and turning them into Sith assassins. The Jedi manage to save the babies before they are melted by lava, but they are unable to uncover who is behind this messed up plot. Chapter 5, The Battle of Malastar. Malastar was home to a species known as the Dug. 
You might remember that charming pod racer from Phantom Menace, Sebulba. He's a pretty good representation of the species. They had long snouts, walked on their arms, and used their legs as hands, which meant that they ate with their feet. Which actually doesn't really make sense if you look at how their limbs are proportioned. I mean, something really, really messed up happened in their evolution. Probably. The dogs like Mosa, the sketchier-looking non-humans in the galaxy, were generally not to be trusted. They were usually hyper-aggressive and pissed off. This was due to the fact that their culture had, at one point in time, been subjugated by the advanced Grand Race. Combine that with an average height of only one meter, and you had an entire species with a Napoleon complex. The dogs were relatively xenophobic and rarely ever left their homeworld. The ones that did usually ended up being criminals. Malastar's location in the galaxy was pretty important. It was situated in the mid-rim on the Hydean Way, an important trade artery connecting the outer rim to the core worlds. Several victories earlier in the war on planets like Ryloth, Naboo, Geonosis, and also Christophus happened in this sector of space, and now the Republic were looking for a supply and resource depot that they could supply their newly gained territory from. Furthermore, the outer rim hub world of Iradu, home of the Tarkin family, was just one hyperspace jump away from Malastar. Iradu was connected to both the Hydean Way and Rima trade route, along with important industrial planets like Solus. The shared lane of hyperspace lanes converging on Naradu made it a key strategic point for both the Republic and the Separatists, and for the Republic, Malastar was their gateway to that system. And not only did Malastar have a strategically vital location, it also had a large reserve of fuel ready for export. As a matter of fact, the native dugs had deforested giant sections of the world in order to pump out Malastarian fuel, and it made up a majority of their economic production. So it comes to no surprise that both the Republic and Separatist forces sent massive armies to conquer the planet. This theater of the war was important enough to warrant the presence of not only Mace Windu, but also Anakin Skywalker. Like Mentos and Coke, this was a very deadly pairing. Even the Supreme Chancellor was somewhat involved in this battle. He was in the middle of signing a treaty with the Dugs to get access to their massive fuel reserves. The Dugs were, of course, hesitant to sign any treaty with the Republic because things were looking grim on the battlefield. They weren't really sure which side was going to win just yet. Although officially the Republic were fighting to defend the world of Malastar, if the Separatists destroyed Army 1, then the Dug would probably thank the Separatists for liberating their planet from the Republic. Never trust an alien who shakes your hand with their feet. That's just not right. And as of now, the Separatists were definitely on their way to winning the battle. The terrain on Malastar was mostly flat, allowing for massive deployments of troops in essentially parade formation. The Separatist droids were of lower quality, but much quicker and faster to manufacture, and they were able to use their numbers advantage to full effect on Malastar. The Republic clone troopers had superior troopers, but they really weren't able to use the terrain to their advantage like they did on other worlds. But the JR had one ace up their sleeve. Republic scientist Cyan Verbol had developed a giant electro-proton bomb. This was essentially a huge EMP blast, but without a nuclear explosion. Technically speaking, the weapon shouldn't have any long-term negative effects on organic beings, but it would do a ton of damage to any machine or droids within its blast radius. Although there were some small concerns from the Doug and Mace Windu that this gigantic bomb might have some unseen consequences on the environment. Time was running out and the Separatists were making a final push against the Republic forces on the planet. So the Republic sent a wing of Y-bombers escorted by ARC-170s and V-19 Torrent Starfighters to fly directly to the center of the Separatist formation and unleash the weapon. An EMP manifests itself over the center of the droid army and spread out, disabling every droid and machine within miles of the blast. Dr. Bull's weapon was hugely successful and now has given the Republic a huge advantage over the Separatist droid army. Although it does seem kind of odd that the Separatists have put limited EM shielding on their droids. Something will have to significantly change for future battles. Anyway, the victory is won, or at least that's what everyone thinks. You see, the Republic just happened to have detonated the EMP over very unstable ground. And suddenly, a gigantic sinkhole appears beneath the battlefield, swallowing up deactivated droids along with a good portion of the Republic forces, which should have been a bloodless victory for their clone army all of a sudden turned into a bloodbath. In an effort to find survivors, Mace Windu and several squads of clones venture into the sinkhole. The ground is still unstable, and it's possible that the ground might collapse even more. To make matters worse, everything within the sinkhole is obscured by a thick fog. 
Suddenly, a gigantic beast emerges from the fog and attacks the rescue team. It's a monstrous thing, part dragon, part queen from Alien. It's the Zillow Beast, a creature that would feel at home in a Godzilla film, just minus the god. The Republic forces naturally start freaking out. This gigantic 100 meter long, 60,000 metric killing machine was completely impervious to all conventional weapons. The Dug, however, immediately realized what the hell this thing is. Long ago, before the Dugs had become an advanced society, the Zilla Beast ruled the planet and roamed freely across its surface, devouring entire cities. The Dug finally collected all their resources and technology and fought a devastating war against the Zilla Beast, which drove them to extinction. Worse yet, the Doug had a prophecy that one day, one Zilla Beast would come back and destroy their entire civilization. So naturally, the Dugs were all freaking out about this situation. As a matter of fact, the Doug Council threatens to withdraw themselves from the Republic Fuel Treaty if the JR doesn't immediately kill the giant monster. But the Jedi argued that it would be very wrong to kill an innocent creature, a creature's home you have just disturbed. Classic Jedi nonsense. They wouldn't be saying the same thing if the Zillow Beast burst into the Jedi Temple and just started eating younglings. But then Dr. Cyan Verbold points out that the monster's impervious armor could prove to be very beneficial for the Republic War Machine. If they could somehow replicate or create a synthetic form of this armor for their own soldiers, they could save a lot of lives. So the JAR attempts to use the RX-200 Falchion class assault tank to bring down the Zillow Beast. Like the self-propelled heavy artillery turbo laser, the RX-200 utilized a giant ion beam that typically would be used on a capital ship. These artillery platforms were designed to pierce deflector shields and could easily bring down something as large as a Star Destroyer. They were also pretty good at disabling the engines of any kind of mechanized machine. The Republic would use multiple stun tanks to knock out the Zillow Beast. The stupid Doug would think that the Zillow Beast was dead, they would sign the treaty, and then the JR would be able to bring the Zillow Beast back home to study. But it didn't work out that way. You see, even the stun tanks aren't really enough to completely take out the giant reptile. Luckily, the Doug did find out in one of their ancient manuscripts that the Zillow Beast had one weakness, Malastar Fuel, which they began immediately flooding into the sinkhole. This combined with the stun tanks finally puts the Zillow Beast out. The Republic wins the day, and win the fuel contract, and win a giant monster. Palpatine is super happy. The Zilla Beast, for some reason, is brought back to Coruscant. Most likely, Palpatine and his scientists have never seen King Kong or Godzilla. Clearly, it would have been a better idea to place the Zilla Beast on a less populated planet, which wasn't completely covered in a giant city full of trillions of people. Mace Windu expresses his concerns once again, but Palpatine is adamant that they figure out what makes the Beast's armor so strong. Dr. Bull immediately begins working on the beast and debriefs Palpatine. In order to advance with their analysis, they would need to take the monster's scale off its body. This would be an incredibly painful process. Palpatine, being the humane person that he was, suggests just killing the Zillow Beast. Like most mad scientists, Bull finds beauty in this horrendous creature and theorizes that it might be even sentient. And because it's the last of its kind, killing it would be immoral. But in reality, what is immoral is letting that gigantic monster rampage through Coruscant. Which is exactly what happens. After Bull attempts to kill the Zillow Beast with some Malastarian fuel, the creature escapes from its restraints and starts smashing everything as it works its way across Coruscant. But instead of just aimlessly wandering around and killing things, the Zilla Beast is heading directly towards the Senate District. It remembers Palpatine and wants to kill him. Luckily, this area is also near the Jedi Temple and Yoda leads a team of Jedi to try to attempt to neutralize the beast or stall long enough to let the military arrive. The JAR was refitting some of their gunships with Malastar and fueled weapons. The Zilla Beast manages to take out a transport evacuating Chancellor Palpatine and just as the beast is about to close in for the final blow, several Republic gunships arrive and bomb the monster with Malastar and fuel. The poisonous gas floods the area and slowly the Zilla Beast succumbs. The gas also almost kills Palpatine. Luckily, several Jedi are there with them and they create a force bubble that prevents the gas from overwhelming them. So I guess this episode was about being careful and not using super weapons when you can avoid it. Even with weapons like the EMP, which is supposed to be harmless, you can see there's a lot of terrible side effects. The development of the Electro Proton Bomb should have changed everything for the Republic. It was an extremely powerful area effect weapon that could take out droids, but leave organic life forms relatively unharmed. For some reason, we don't really see it being used ever again. Sure, it created a sinkhole and a giant beast emerged from the ground, but that was a freak accident. Perhaps the Electro Proton Bomb was too expensive to manufacture. Who knows? Anyway, after the Republic victory on Geonosis, 
A small garrison of clones was all the JAR could afford to leave on the planet because the Separatist droid army was quickly spreading across the Outer Rim, attacking many different Republic worlds. The Geonosians had simply gone underground into their hives, and just a few months after the battle, they emerged and retook the planet. After the Battle of Malastar, the Jedi began suspecting that banking clan Senator Rush Clovis was secretly working with the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Padme Amidala used to be close to Clovis back when she first joined the Senate. So the Jedi Council decides to send Padme to go spy on her former colleague who also happens to have a big crush on her. While undercover on Cato Nemoidia, she witnessed a secret meeting between Senator Lot Dodd, Archduke Pago the Lesser, and Clovis. They were discussing the financing of a new droid factory on Geonosis for the Separatist Alliance. This was a clear violation of Republic sanctions against the Separatist Alliance. But let's be honest, everyone in the galaxy knew that the Trade Federation, intergalactic banking clans, along with several of the other corporate alliances, were playing both sides of the war. There was a lot of money involved, so no one really wanted to call them out about it. But the creation of this new droid factory warranted a Republic invasion. Although it's kind of strange that the Republic didn't invade when their garrison just suddenly disappeared. The Republic invasion fleet they send is one of the biggest assembled so far during the war. It's made up of six Venator class Star Destroyers and 10 Acclimator class assault ships and close to 200,000 clone troopers. The Separatists led by Geonosian Archduke Pago the Lesser is holed up in his new factory, which is shielded. He lacks a defensive fleet of his own, and his air cover is limited to just Geonosian starfighters. The Republic could have probably waited in orbit and just bombarded the Separatist base, but that probably would have taken too long and the Separatists would have been able to call in reinforcements. So the Republic carry on an assault, which consisted of three main forces, led by Kiyoti Mundi, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Anakin Skywalker. Their goal would be to reach a staging area in front of the shield and attempt to breach it. They needed to take Poggle alive to end the Geonosians from rising up again. The problem with the Republic plan is they grossly underestimate the Geonosians' defenses. Their original plan was to fly directly to the staging area. Unbeknownst to them, for kilometers around the factory, the Geonosians had erected robust anti-air emplacements to make up for their lack of air support. Obi-Wan Kenobi's task force was the first to launch. They encountered heavy fire, and Kenobi's dropship was shot down relatively close to the landing zone. Anakin's task force launched second, and they fly straight into a wall of enemy flak and fighters. Anakin's gunship is also shot down, and he also loses the majority of his walkers. Things are starting to look pretty grim. Ki Adi Mundi's task force is behind Anakin's, and upon seeing how heavy the air defenses are, decide to land far away from the objective in order to save their own armor from getting destroyed. Although before they do that, Ki and Mundi's gunship is also shot down. So the Republic forces have suffered heavy losses before they even get close to their landing zone. All three Jedi generals have been shot down, and their forces are now spread thin. Kenobi forces are closest to the landing zone, and they quickly are surrounded by Separatist forces. They must hold on until the other two task force link up with them. For those of you who know World War II history, the second battle of Genosis makes Operation Marker Garden seem like a cakewalk. Anakin's forces are also pinned down by enemy fire, and with the loss of their armor, they must fight on foot but a giant fortress separates them from their destination. Luckily, Anakin is probably one of the most skilled combatants in the Republic and an expert at vertical assaults, and easily takes out the droid garrison. Ki Mundi's task force still has armor, but a large ridge separates them from the rest of the Republic force. Mundi's walkers, which are full of wounded, try to find their way around the ridge and will rendezvous with them later at the landing point. Ki Mundi leads the rest of his infantry through a cave system that hopefully leads them to the landing point. Luckily, Mundy's brought flamethrowers as well because he's walked right into the entrance of a Geonosian hive. And yes, Geonosians pop and crackle when you set them on fire. Back at the landing point, Kenobi's forces continue holding off Separatist attacks. Most of their armor is knocked out, almost everyone is wounded or dead. But somehow they still are holding on. Anakin and Ki Mundy's forces have managed to break through and are close to linking up. But before they get there, a squadron of Y Wings come in danger close and manage to stop the latest Separatist attack from overwhelming their position. But the Republic forces don't have any time to rest just yet. With the three task force finally gathered together, Obi Wan Kenobi makes a quick plan for attack. Anakin leads a small squad in his usual suicidal frontal assault through the factory shield and knocks out the enemy anti-tank guns. This allows the remaining Republic armor to march through the shield and take out the generator, which then allows Kiyoti Mundi to land with the rest of the infantry and gunships. The Republic forces are successful in taking out the shield and now prepare to make the final push towards the Geonosian factory. Kenobi and Mundi are evacuated for medical treatment. 
Anakin and Ahsoka Tano are joined by Master Luminara and her Padawan Barris Ophi. To reach the factory, the Republic forces must cross over a thin bridge, a bottleneck that the Jane Oceans will defend to the last man. Bug. Man bug. Wanting to avoid a direct frontal assault, Master Luminara proposes sending the Padawan into the underground Geonosian Hive tunnels where they can access the factory from below and blow it up with explosives. Luminara and Berezofi are quite different from Anakin and Ahsoka. They like doing things by the book and following the rules of the Order without any deviation. They are also against improvisation and usually had a pretty good and solid plan for any mission or battle. Berezofi had memorized the entire Geonosian Hive tunnel system. While well, Padawans make their way underground, the Masters launch a diversion attack over the narrow factory bridge. They want to draw the attentions of the defenders, but they also don't want to take too many casualties. The plan works and the Separatist droids send a huge army to confront the clones. But the Republic forces are in for a nasty surprise. The Separatists have developed a super tank. This was a massive vehicle with heavy armor and ray shield technology. It proved to be too tough for even the Republic's heavy artillery and forced the clone forces to retreat. The Jedi then draw the super tanks onto the bridge and blow it up, sending the vehicles falling into the canyon. Meanwhile, inside the factory before the Padawan can set off their explosives, they're attacked by the Jane Oceans who steal their ordnance. With no other options left, Ahsoka and Barris decide to use a super tank's main gun to destroy the central reactor instead, sacrificing themselves and setting the entire factory crashing down on them. Master Luminar, being a perfect Jedi, is ready to sacrifice her Padawan and assumes that they have died. Master Skywalker, being a flawed human being, will do anything to save his Padawan and begins searching through the wreckage. Luckily, the Separatists have built a hell of a tank and the clones manage to uncover the Padawan's super tank before their oxygen runs out. But the battle is still not over. The hive tunnels that the Padawan have gone in were just a small part of a massive network that covered most of the planet. Geonosis was a terrible place to live on. The surface was completely dry and dead and irradiated, so most of the Geonosians actually lived underneath the surface. With his forces defeated, Poggle the Lesser escapes into these tunnels and is followed by Master Luminara. As usual, she's quite useless and gets captured, forcing Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin to send out a rescue team into the creepy tunnels, which is where they encounter Geonosian zombies for the first time. Unbeknownst to the Republic, Pongo the Lesser is not the true ruler of the Geonosians, he's just a puppet. The true ruler of the planet is Queen Karina the Great, a massive queen bug. Someone call in the Terran Federation. The way Queen Karina controls her hive is by using brainworms, which turn sentient beings into mindless zombie slaves. Uh, look, I get that the Republic and the Jedi are supposed to be humane. But whenever you encounter a hive mind alien species, whether it's the Zerg, the Arachnids, the Formex, or the Borg, extermination is the only way forward. This is why the Death Star is needed. That or they could just put some thrusters on the planet and pilot the planet slowly into its nearby star. But no, instead the Jedi force their way into the Geonosian lair, fighting hundreds of zombies on their way. They realize that the zombies do have a weakness and it's light. They manage to rescue Luminara, arrest Poggle, and also at the same time send the Queen's lair crashing down on her hopefully killing her. But unfortunately, one of the worms managed to escape and has infected one of the clone troopers who takes the worm off planet on a clone medical frigate. Luckily, Ahsoka Tano and Barriss Afi are on that frigate as well and prevent the worm from taking complete control over the ship, ending the Geonosian threat. The Geonosians are more or less spent at this point with their queen dead and with Poggle the Lesser arrested. They don't really do much for the rest of the war and then when the Imperial era comes around, they end up building the Death Star until the Empire decides to kill all of them. Chapter seven, Battle of Selikamai. The Republic's destruction of the Separatist war factories on Geonosis was a big blow to the Separatist Alliance, but it still wasn't enough to stop their advance in the Outer Rim. The Separatist droid army still greatly outnumbered the clone army, and the elusive General Grievous personally was responsible for causing a bunch of chaos and hunting down Jedi. His latest and most ambitious plan was to capture someone on the Jedi Council, Master Eeth Koth. Eeth Koth was a Zabrak Jedi who hailed from the slums of Narshada deep in Hut territory. He was brought to the Jedi Temple at a slightly older age and quickly excelled at being a Jedi. He was in command of the Venator class Star Destroyer Steadfast when Grievous boards him with his own Recusant class warship. Clone Captain Locke and his troopers attempt to hold off the droid boarding party for as long as possible, but within the thin, short corridors of a ship, the super battle droids and commando droids prove to be too heavily armed to be stopped. 
Heathcoth had realized immediately that they were outnumbered. A Separatist warship the size of a Recusant class could hold up to 30,000 war droids. A Viner class Star Destroyer could only hold maybe one or 2,000 clone troopers. So he orders the clones under his command to fall back to the escape pods. Held up in the bridge, Koth is determined to face down General Grievous himself without risking too many clone lives. Grievous breaches and lets his commander droids take out Koth's small attachment of clones, which they do pretty easily. They even manage to wound Koth in the arm in the process with a blaster bolt. But Koth manages to destroy all the commando droids, but his last clone goes down as well, electrocuted in the back by newly arrived Magna Guard droids. Trained personally by Grievous in the first form of lightsaber combat, these droids were specialized in fighting enemies with lightsabers. They were quite formidable. Koth, favoring his uninjured arm, does his best against Grievous and his guards, but ultimately is beaten down by a cheap blow in the back when his lightsaber is in lock with Grievous's. Grievous then contacts the Jedi Order in a very ISIS-like ransom video and mocks the High Council over his recent victory. But upon reviewing the transmission, Commander Cody realizes that Master Koth was using hand signals to communicate that he was in the Selikamai system. There's really no reason for Grievous to do this, unless maybe he was setting a trap for the Republic, which he wasn't. So most likely he did this just to gloat. His people, the Kalishi, had some major beef with the Republic after all. But this was a big slip up for Grievous, and this is all the Jedi Council needed to track him down, which they've been trying to do for quite some time. They send a fleet led by Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, and Adi Galea. Obi-Wan plans on using himself as bait to lure Grievous onto his ship. The two have a history together, and the cyborg is very interested in killing the Jedi. As Obi-Wan jumps into the Salakamai system, Anakin and Adi would sneak on Grievous' ship and rescue Master Koth. When Obi-Wan arrives into the system, the Separatist fleet engages and the cyborg rushes headfirst into his trap. Grievous really wants to defeat Obi-Wan Kenobi in hand-to-hand -hand combat, such is the Kalish way. With the Battle of Salakamai in full swing, Anakin and Adi aboard a small transport make a super risky hyperspace jump to right alongside Grievous' ship. They board Grievous' ship and make their way to the detention cell with a small squad of clones led by Captain Rex. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan Kenobi and his clones engage General Grievous' commando droids and Magna Guards. Obi-Wan's clones suffer a similar fate as Eeth Koth's during the initial assault, but Obi-Wan Kenobi is a master of Form 3 and very capable at defending himself. All he needs to do is buy enough time for Anakin to retrieve Koth. But they've run into their own problems as Master Koth was much more heavily guarded than they initially realized. But there's a reason why Anakin is the chosen one, and he easily fights off the droid ambush and rescues Koth. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan has defeated all of Grievous' droids, forcing the general to retreat. The cyborg orders his droids to open fire on the Republic ship, which is still attached to his ship, destroying it. He then commands the rest of his droids, launch their landers, and head for the surface of Salakumai. Salakumai was located in the outer rim of the galaxy. Salakumai meant oasis in Pentorin. While the planet itself was not all that special, just a mix of deserts, swamps, and forests, it was the only habitable planet in the entire system, and one that was sparsely populated. As a matter of fact, it was a very popular place for people who wanted to escape the war to go. Originally, Grievous had planned on taking the planet without the GAR even noticing, something that routinely happened during the opening years of the war in the outer rim. This is the problem with having to defend millions of systems at the same time against a numerically superior foe. But the Republic's massive fleet was sent to do one thing, and that was to take Grievous out. While Grievous was occupied with the Jedi, Admiral Wolf Yolaren had taken apart the smaller Separatist fleet, and although several ships had escaped the Separatist fleet for the surface of Salakamai, they did so without cover, and many of the landing ships, including Grievous's, was damaged. The landers would have to scatter on their way down to the planet to avoid being shot down. Kenobi and his clones attempt to track down Grievous' position and land soon after in an Acclimator-class assault ship. They move in force to the last known position of Grievous' escape pod, and they would use that area as an epicenter for a wider search pattern. Grievous is desperate to get off the planet, and his troops are running dangerously low on supplies, including power cells. They acquired some of the local animals and used them as mounts in order to save energy. Grievous still has a few commando droids left, and he deploys them on the flanks of his formation and uses them to screen his movements. The droids were relatively cheap, and only Grievous' life actually mattered. The crash had knocked out their communications, and there was only one escape pod nearby that they could reach on foot. They have to try their best to make it there and see if the communicator in that escape pod is still working. 
Meanwhile, Captain Rex had taken a group of clones on a search pattern towards the wetlands using speeders. The speeders were very fast, but completely unarmored. And unfortunately for Rex, they run into a separatist sniper squad who had set up an ambush. The commander droids were machines, so hitting a moving target even as fast as a speeder was no problem. And Captain Rex takes a blast around straight to the chest. It's hard enough to knock him off the bike, which alone should have killed them. But somehow he survives, but his chest armor is breached. The type of sniper rifle that the commando droids are using is incredibly powerful even at long range. But luckily, Rex was a captain and had armored pauldrons, which provided an additional layer of blaster protection over his chest. The concussion of the blast was tremendous and knocked him out, and the round also pierced his chest, but he was still alive. After taking out the BX commando droids, the clones check on Rex. Luckily, clone medic Jesse is there, and he manages to stabilize Rex. Back at Grievous's pod, Commander Cody had managed to extract some info from one of the Separatist droids and found out about another escape pod in the region. Obi-Wan Kenobi connects the dots, and they quickly head in that direction. Hopefully, they can cut Grievous off. Jesse realizes that Captain Rex is far too weak to travel on, especially on the back of a stretcher tied to a speeder bike. They must find temporary shelter for Rex and then come back later with some actual transportation. They see grazing animals near them hinting that a farm or ranch is probably nearby, and they go off looking for it. Perhaps the locals will be friendly enough to shelter Rex. They encounter a pink Twi'lek armed with some kind of slug thrower, and although she is suspicious, she lets them eventually bring the captain into the barn where Jesse puts a back to pad on Rex's wound. The bolt had missed his heart by two inches, and he also had some nerve damage in his arm. But other than that, he'd be fine. He just needed to stay behind, doctor's orders. Jesse and the other clones would continue their search and call for help. Later that night, Rex is shocked to find the husband of the Twi'lek farmer was a clone. You see, earlier in the war, a Republic operation came to Salakamai and a Republic gunship was shot down by Separatist gunships. The sole survivor of that incident was a trooper called Cut Lequain. After this traumatic experience, Cut reevaluated his life and realized he no longer wanted to fight for the JAR. He was one of the rare clones that deserted from the clone army. And given the circumstances, he had a pretty good opportunity to get away and get away clean. He settled down with a Twi'lek whose name was Sue, and Sue also had two children who Cut adopted. Although Rex at first is angry about him deserting, Cut eventually explains his rationale. The clones had never been given a choice on whether they wanted to fight or not. They were basically born for the job. Instead of serving, the Republic Cut wanted now to serve his family, something he chose to do. It's quite remarkable he made this choice, even with all the alterations to his DNA that the Kaminoans tried to engineer into him. I guess those fish heads were always hyping up their cloning abilities. Rex avoids pressing the issue of Cut's desertion when his family arrives. Rex is, after all, a good man, and there's no reason to make a father look bad in front of his children. This is one of the more introspective scenes in The Clone Wars. It's one of the few times we see Disney canon actually talk about this very controversial subject of having an entire army of slaves. Although Rex and Cut ultimately disagree, they can respect each other and the path in life they have each chosen. Which is a good thing because another separatist escape pod was just outside of Cut's land. And that night, the two clones had to combine forces and fight off a squad of commando droids who decided to go and investigate the house. Grievous and his squad had reached the other escape pod. The communicator was working and a rescue team was on its way. But most of Grievous' squad had run out of battery and had deactivated. Obi-Wan's tank column are close behind them, and soon they run into the droid forces. A skirmish ensues, but unfortunately, Grievous manages to escape once again to live and fight another day. The next day, Captain Rex rejoins the Republic forces and casually forgets to report Cut's location to the Republic. The two have created a friendship forged by mutual understanding and combat. Which is exactly how I met British Ben and American Ben. Well, guys, there you have it. That is episode seven of our Clone Wars history series. As you can see, uh, this video, especially the episode that talks about desertion, really goes in depth about what it means to be a clone and how a lot of the clones had different reactions to basically uh, being slaves. Chapter eight, Coruscant Black Market Weapons Trade. The war wasn't only being fought in the Outer Rim and on the front lines. Darth Plagueis and Dark Sidious had started their entire plan to take over the galaxy with the Underworld, and their connections to the various gangs and crime syndicates that ran rampant across the galaxy. The good thing about criminals is when you work with them, they rarely will ask you for credentials, and they'll rarely give you a receipt, which means less of a paper trail to worry about. So a Sith Lord could stay hidden, which was a very important part of Palpatine's plan. 
With the start of the Clone Wars came an increase in instability and unrest across the galaxy. While the Grand Army of the Republic rushed from planet to planet to put out the various brush fires started by the Separatist forces in the Outer Rim, the Judicials tried to keep peace on the home front. The war was causing plenty of problems in the core region as well. Refugees were flooding in from the Outer Rim, and in the second year of the war at least, anti-war protests became more prevalent. Meanwhile, all sorts of criminals, opportunists, and bounty hunters were taking advantage of the instability and making their money in the margins, oftentimes exploiting the weak and desperate. One particularly problematic industry that exploded thanks to the war was the black market arms trade. The course on Underworld had become increasingly bold thanks to the large amount of Separatist money flooding the streets. While the Separatist Alliance had plenty of raw resources and industrial might, Republic weapons and technology was still in high demand. Anakin and his Padawan Ahsoka Tano take a break from the front lines and venture into the depths of the planet in pursuit of a potential arms dealer who is acquiring merchandise for the Separatists. While arresting the criminal, Ahsoka has her lightsaber snatched away from her. The young Padawan is afraid to tell her master what had happened and instead tries to figure out a way to get her lightsaber back herself. She goes to her other mentor in the Jedi Order, someone she had recently been tasked with helping, Jocasta Nu, the head librarian. Master Nu might not have been the most powerful Jedi in the Order, but because of her position, she almost knew everyone in the Order. And using that knowledge, the librarian takes Ahsoka to see Master Terra Sanube. Sanube was an expert on criminal organizations operating out of the Coruscant underworld. Upon hearing Ahsoka Tano's story, he identifies that the Padawan had been ripped off by a Petroleum, an aquatic alien species that was quite rare. Searching through the criminal database, the master was able to pull up a photo of the pickpocket for Ahsoka to identify. His name was Bonamu. And before Ahsoka can protest, Sanube volunteers to go with her to the underworld to find the thief. I think it's amazing that Master Sanube was able to figure out who the thief was based on some very basic physical description from Ahsoka Tano. Coruscant was a massive worldwide city and had a population of well over a trillion sentient beings. The Coruscant security force was in charge of policing the world and at least on the surface and upper levels, they maintained a strong presence. Interestingly enough, on the richer and higher levels, the Coruscant police were mostly made up of droids. The officers were usually human or at least humanoid. But for the most part, the droids took care of most of the policing. They did everything from uh, providing security for officials to giving parking tickets. These droids were incorruptible and objective enforcers of the law, and when a case was questionable, they also served as a perfect witness for a crime. In those more complex cases, organic investigators would be deployed and go over the case. But strangely enough, in the lower levels of the planet, policing was mainly done by the infamous Coruscant Underworld Police, completely comprised of organic beings. Perhaps in an advanced society like Coruscant, the idea of organic beings policing other organic beings is seen as backwards and a primitive way of doing things. Although it's probably very likely that these droids were not as flexible or creative enough to deal with the various threats an officer would deal with in the Coruscant underworld. Compared to the clean and bright blue CSF droids, the underworld police looked almost like shock troopers, heavily armored and wearing metal helmets and mechanized goggles. The underworld police looked as dystopian as their surroundings did. And despite their best efforts, the underworld of Coruscant could hardly be called a stable or even safe place to travel in. As a matter of fact, it was well known that certain levels in the Coruscant underworld were completely under the control of crime syndicates and no-go areas even for the police. The lowest levels of Coruscant were full of even more terrifying and violent things, which basically made those areas uninhabitable. So while things might feel hopeless, a Jedi like Terra Sanube had been studying the criminal underworld for his entire life, and he's able to point out a few markets where this thief most likely would try to sell Ahsoka's lightsaber. The two immediately head for District G-17, one of the many thousands of slums located in the Coruscant underworld. They approach a dingy-looking food stand staffed by a sketchy-looking Corrin. Never trust those squiddy bastards, they're always up to no good. Ahsoka asks the Corrin if he has any lightsabers to sell. In my opinion, Ahsoka is clearly acting like a narc right now, but luckily she is a teenager and she's being accompanied by an old man, so they don't really seem like police officers. And the corn must be desperate to move the Jedi lightsaber. It clearly will attract a lot of unwanted trouble, and no one fears the Jedi more than criminal scum. But the corn's opening price for the lightsaber is quite steep, 20,000 credits. 
that's enough to buy an entire land speeder. But of course, Ahsoka, as usual, doesn't have much tact and immediately reveals she's a Jedi. Luckily, that's enough to scare the Corn into revealing the location of the thief. The two Jedi track the thief to a nearby hostel. Notice all of the artificial light in the lower levels of Coruscant. It's not just there for nighttime, it's there for all the time. It's even rumored that in the deeper and more primitive parts of Coruscant, the inhabitants consider the sun and daylight a myth. Anything lower than the first few dozen layers of the Undercity didn't have a day and night cycle. Anyway, the two Jedi are able to use the Force inside the hostel to find the room where their thief is staying, but unfortunately they find that the lightsaber has already exchanged hands to an individual known as Knack Movers, a feared Trandoshan assassin. Usually illegal weapons, especially larger shipments, would eventually go through an organization known as the Black Suns. The Black Suns, like most of the criminal organizations in the galaxy, like to dabble in everything from spice to slave trafficking. But they mainly specialized in two things, providing muscle and weapons smuggling. The two businesses kind of go hand in hand. Given the specialized nature of the lightsaber, however, it makes sense that an assassin would get its hands on it. This was a special item and most likely Knack Movers was willing to pay much more than, let's say, a Black Suns arms merchant. Ahsoka and Master Sinube continued their search for the lightsaber and traveled to the upper side of Happy Land, one of the many districts in Coruscant. Having her lightsaber fall into the hands of an assassin or a murderer is a very troubling thought for Ahsoka, especially if bodies start turning up with cauterized wounds. But when they arrive, the Trandoshan is found dead in his apartment. A Torellian Django jumper and her partner in crime now have possession of the lightsaber, and the chase continues. Torellian Django jungers were just one of many interesting species on Coruscant. These blue humanoids had extremely powerful muscles and bone structure, which allowed them to run at superhuman speeds and jump extremely long distances. They could easily rival a talented Jedi's own force abilities. Happy Land was still technically a part of the underworld, but it had large skyscrapers, most of which reached the surface of the planet. There were huge gaps in between the buildings here, which made it a perfect place for a Django jumper to have hit less gifted pursuers. At this point, the Coruscant security forces are called in as backup. They have access to an assortment of vehicles, which allow them to move quickly around the underworld. This included the Panther Police Interceptor. These were kind of similar to flying cop cars from Blade Runner. They were small enough to filter through buildings and had a top speed of around 220 miles per hour. The Underworld Police also used speeder bikes like the Bark Speeder. The police used these vehicles to patrol the incredibly confusing traffic lanes of Coruscant. Although all speeders can fly using anti-grav technology, they couldn't just fly anywhere they wanted to. That would make the roads incredibly chaotic. People would die all the time. So instead, there's a very complex 3D road grid that runs at different levels and vectors. All of this was further controlled by the traffic division of the Coruscant Security Force. Fortunately, the two criminals managed to get away from the complicated grid of roads in the Undercity, but just momentarily because Master Shinube had managed to place a tracker on one of them, and they followed the criminals to her original train station. Maglevs that ran on repulsors crisscrossed the planet, and it was one of the quickest ways and cheapest ways to disappear onto the other side of the planet. After one final chase, the thieves are caught and Ahsoka manages to get her lightsaber back. And we finish our little tour of one of the most fascinating cities in Star Wars. Like I've always said, I wish Star Wars 1313 was never canceled. And I really do hope that the future Fallen Jedi video game or even the Mandalorian TV show will have us visit Coruscant once again. Never has there been a background as rich and ripe for discovery. So there you have it guys, as you know I always love it when any Star Wars property goes into Coruscant and the Undercity. This was a quick glimpse at what the Underworld was like and how the local security forces worked. In this episode we'll be looking at the world of Mandalore and the complicated battle for the future and soul of the Mandalorian people. We're relatively different from the legendary Mandalorians older fans are used to. The Mandalorians of old were a great tribe of space warriors whose culture revolved around honor and combat. Thousands of years of constant warfare naturally took a toll on the Mandalorians and on their world. During the Clone Wars period, Duchess Satine Christ sits on the throne. Just decades earlier, Satine Christ's faction called the New Mandalorians had fought a devastating civil war against a faction of old school Mandalorians who wanted to continue on the warrior traditions of their people. 
Ultimately, Satine's faction won. Having studied her people's past, she believed that pacifism was the only way her people could survive. With the start of the Clone Wars, the Mandalorians took a stance of neutrality, refusing to enter either side of the war. Their actions inspired many other planets, and together these worlds formed the Council of Neutral Systems, with Duchess Satine as their leader. For the most part, the Mandalorians had kept the violence of the Clone Wars away from their planet. But the Republic Senate was wary that the Mandalorians were going to use their influence over the Council of Neutral Systems to break off from the Republic, as the Separatists had done before. And so the Jedi Order, at the behest of the Senate, sends Obi-Wan Kenobi to Mandalore to find out exactly what is going on. Obi-Wan Kenobi had originally visited Mandalore with Qui-Gon Jinn in a mission to keep Satine Christ safe during the Civil War. What most people didn't know was that Obi-Wan and Satine had grown quite close during that mission. Qui-Gon Jinn wasn't exactly the most orthodox Jedi Master and probably looked the other way as their young romance began to bud. Upon meeting the Prime Minister and Duchess, they both parrot the same words. Mandalore is loyal and things are going great on their world. The Mandalorians are a peaceful kind of people. And all the big bad warriors their culture was known for had been sent to the moon where they had died off. Of course, Obi-Wan Kenobi has had his own experience with Mandalorians and is quite skeptical. And he turns out to be right. While touring the city together in private, Satine, away from her advisors, admits that the renegade Mandalorians Obi-Wan had encountered were most likely the Death Watch. A group of super violent, but also arguably a lot cooler, Mandalorians that live by the old ways. Most Mandalorians had assumed that after the Civil War, they had just disappeared. While Satine is trying to assure Obi-Wan Kenobi that they're only a small nuisance, an explosion interrupts them, one of the latest attempts by the Death Watch to destabilize the Duchess's rule. After surviving the attack, Satine and Obi-Wan ventured to Mandalore's moon, Concordia, in order to look for signs of Death Watch. The two are greeted upon landing by Governor Pre Visla. While Satine is entertained by the governor, Obi-Wan goes on a fact-finding mission to check out one of the nearby mining facilities. The Mandalorian commandos he had encountered before were all wearing the legendary Beskar armor, something that can only be created here on Mandalore or on its moon, Concordia. The mines and factories were supposed to be closed, but the one Obi-Wan enters seems to be functional and is producing Mandalorian armor. And before he can report his findings, he's ambushed and knocked out. Luckily, he still has his comm link on, and he contacts Satine for help once he wakes up again. And she arrives just in time to save him from being smelted. But now the jig is up, the Death Watch is alerted to their presence, and Satine and Obi-Wan finally come face to face with their leader, Governor Pre Vizsla. You see, the governor was from a famous clan, a clan that still followed the old ways. Vizsla had been contacted by Count Dooku, who had promised to support a Death Watch takeover of the planet. Vizsla goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Obi-Wan Kenobi using the legendary Darksaber, a lightsaber that once belonged to a Mandalorian Jedi and now was a sign of Mandalorian leadership. Obi-Wan survives the encounter and manages to escape with the Duchess, but now things grow more complicated. Pre Vizsla and his Death Watch managed to escape before the authorities arrive. And there's a strong indication that the Separatists were backing Pre Vizsla. Which means the Republic might now have to get involved in the affairs of neutral Mandalore. Duchess Satine must venture back to Coruscant to plead their case in front of the Republic Senate. Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker along with an attachment of clones will provide security along the way. They know that most likely someone else will make an attempt on the Duchess and we're on high alert. While Duchess Satine has her little sleepover party with other world leaders who also want to remain neutral, terrifying killer droids activate in the hold of her ship and start killing everyone. Technically called probe killers, these spider-like droids were especially programmed for assassination missions. Satine Christ's pursuit of pacifism was definitely admirable, and perhaps if she were just a mere activist and not the ruler of Mandalore, her views would be harmless. But clearly, pacifism doesn't really work all that well when your enemies are trying to kill you. And once again, it's up to the Jedi and clones to keep those unwilling to fight themselves safe. Anakin and the clones try their best to keep the spider droids below deck, but one manages to make it up to the dining room where Satine is. Although Obi-Wan Kenobi is able to quickly dispatch the large droid, what he didn't realize was that these probe killers were actually carriers for hundreds of smaller killer droids. It's basically everyone's greatest fear when it comes to killing spiders. You don't want to kill a pregnant spider because it might just release hundreds of little tiny spider eggs. Luckily, Satine Christ is carrying a deactivator, a specially made ion weapon that takes out droids fairly easily. With the threat defeated, the Jedi must now find who smuggled these killer assassin droids on board. Most likely, there are more Mandalorians who are loyal to Death Watch. 
Obi-Wan suspects it's one of the senators on board. The box containing the assassin droids had official Republic stamps on them. Obi-Wan comes up with a quick plan. They've recovered one live mini assassin droid and hold it next to each of the senators on board. The mini droids are programmed to kill everyone besides the individual who smuggled it on board in the first place. That's how they find out that the traitor is none other than Senator Talmeric of Kalvala, a planet in the Mandalorian system. In the scuffle that breaks out, Merrick manages to take Satine as hostage and heads to the bridge where he murders the entire crew and calls for reinforcements. While Anakin and the clones fight off the Separatist borders, Obi-Wan Kenobi confronts the traitor and in a moment of complete honesty and vulnerability, Obi-Wan admits to Satine cries his love for her. Had she asked, he would have left the Jedi to be by her side. But then Anakin comes out of nowhere and pokes Senator Merrick with his lightsaber. Classic Anakin. The Duchess makes it all the way to Coruscant, but her troubles are only just beginning. The Death Watch continues to grow in size, but they're not large enough yet to take over the planet, especially if they have to do it by force. Instead, they have to win the hearts and minds of the people, something that would be relatively easy to do if the Republic invaded and they opposed them. And that's exactly what Chancellor Palpatine wants to do. The Death Watch was clearly a threat, most likely just a pawn in his own Sith games. But for now, they were an ally of the Separatists and a threat to the Republic. Satine Kryze realizes she must keep the clone troopers away from Mandalore in order to stop any further escalation in the conflict there. But then Palpatine hits hard with a message from her own deputy minister who states a civil war has already started and that Satine Kryze was trying to hide that from the rest of the galaxy. The minister had been a close friend and his accusations became a shock to Satine. And to make matters worse, the deputy minister was no longer available for explaining what he had accused Satin Kryz for because he had recently died in a bombing on Kalavala. During the break in the Senate session before the Republic votes on sending force to Mandalore, the Duchess's speeder is sabotaged, her loyal bodyguards and drivers sacrifice themselves and bring her to safety before the speeder smashes into the side of a building. This was the work of another Death Watch assassin. But unfortunately, there's no sign of foul play and Chancellor Palpatine himself rules out any criminal activity. To make matters worse, while meeting with Palpatine about the accident, the Senate had pushed forward the vote and had voted in favor of intervention on Mandalore. Clone troopers would leave for Mandalore the next morning. Satine, desperate to find out what had happened, goes into the Undercity by herself to talk to a Mandalorian contact she has in the Ministry of Intelligence. The Mandalorian had gotten his hands on the original Hollow from Deputy Minister, and it looks like the version Palpatine had played for the Senate had been altered. Shortly after exchanging the disc, the intelligence agent is killed by a Death Watch sniper. A nearby police probe registers Satine as the killer. She has proof that she needs to turn over to the Republic, but she's now a wanted criminal. Oh, and that Death Watch assassin is also after her as well. Satine can only turn to one man, someone who will never betray her. Her boo, obi Boo Kenobi. Satine handles Obi-Wan the disc for safekeeping. But before they split up, the assassin tries to kill Satine with a grenade. Very subtle and practical in a crowded city. Unfortunately for the assassin, he didn't count on a Jedi being present and barely manages to escape. Satine eventually turns herself in at the Senate complex, allowing Obi-Wan to freely enter without notice, so that he can get the data disk to Senator Padme Amidala, who shows the real message from the Deputy Minister Kalavella, and it's quite different. Not only did his Deputy Minister show faith in the Duchess's ability to steer the Mandalorian clear of a civil war, he directly warns against the Republic intervention. With this new development, the Senate once again casts its vote against the invasion. Crisis is once again averted. Death Watch does not have enough resources to hold Mandalore without support of its people. So there you have it, guys. As you can see, Mandalorian politics and history is a relatively confusing one. Uh, this is a story arc that we will probably return to once again later on in the war. Chapter 10, Fett's Revenge. Jango Fett was one of the most feared bounty hunters in the galaxy. Legends say that during the Battle of Galadron, Fett killed multiple Jedi with his bare hands. It's also said that Count Dooku had been the leader of the Jedi forces at the battle and had been so impressed with the bounty hunter that he selected him for the template for the clone army. Fett was an ordinary human being, but he was extremely skilled and talented when it came to combat. While the average Jedi is more talented than the average human, Django existed in that small area where the most skilled humans surpassed the more average Jedi. Mace Windu, however, was not only above average for a Jedi, he was probably one of the most talented swordsmen in the entire Jedi Order, and therefore the galaxy. 
Django never really had a chance against him. And being the terrible father he was, Django bought his son slash clone Boba Fett to the execution slash battle, and the boy was there to witness his progenitor's beheading. And because Boba is a Fett, he's not gonna just let that go. He's determined to get his revenge from Mace Windu. I know it's a pretty un-Jedi thing to do, but Mace Windu probably should have murdered the little bastard when he had a chance. You see, Boba had the perfect cover. He looked like every clone trooper in the clone army, well, every young cadet at least. He used his appearance to infiltrate the Venator Star Destroyer Endurance as a part of the Clone Youth Brigade. Jedi Generals Anakin Skywalker and Mace Windu were on their way to rendezvous with the Endurance for a bit of R&R. &R. Boba fits right in with the rest of the young cadets, but he definitely seems a bit more talented and independent. In Legends, we know that the less altered clones retained more of Fett's skill and aggressiveness in battle. Boba is a completely unaltered version of Jango, whereas all the clone cadets are bred to be more obedient and also potentially suffer from some degradation when it comes to motor skills and ability. Once the Jedi Generals arrive on board, they brief the young cadets, allowing Boba to make visual confirmation that Mace Windu is in fact on board. Boba manages to slip away and booby trap the Jedi Master's room with a classic laser tripwire bomb. Fortunately for Mace Windu, he's called off for a meeting at the last second before he enters his room and avoids getting his legs blown off. But a clone trooper who is sent in his place isn't as lucky. The entire ship goes on alert as a result of the explosion. Boba must act quickly. It's only a matter of time before they figure out that he doesn't belong on that ship. Running out of options, Boba contacts the bounty hunter he's working with, Aura Singh, for advice. Singh tells Boba to blow the reactor and take out the entire ship. Boba is hesitant at first about this idea. He doesn't want to harm the clones on board, just Mace Windu. After Django had lost his head, the clones were basically the closest thing he had to a family. But Singh pressures Boba into destroying the entire ship, and so he heads to the reactor where he stuns a guard with a blaster and shoots the reactor control panels, which quickly destabilizes the engines. The Jedi are almost sucked out into vacuum in the ensuing explosion, but managed to make it off the ship in starfighters. Meanwhile, Boba rejoins the other cadets and leaves the ship on one of the escape pods. But before that escape pod can rendezvous with the other pods, Boba sabotages his vessel, allowing Slave One, piloted by Aura Singh, to pick him up. He still has a mission to finish. Meanwhile, the Jedi and clones search for survivors in the crash site. Admiral Killian and the command crew have managed to land the Endurance on the nearby planet of Vancor, mostly intact. Once inside the crash site, they find a dead clone trooper who seems to have been killed after the crash. The Jedi surmise it must be the assassins who have come aboard the ship to verify that Mace Windu was in fact dead. The Jedi decide to split up and head to the bridge while the droids search the rest of the ship for survivors. The droids quickly realize they weren't alone. The planet was infested with terrifying Gundarks, powerful six-limbed monsters. While Mace Windu's droid is ripped apart, R2-D2 manages to escape somehow intact. Meanwhile, on the bridge, the two Jedi spot Jango Fett's helmet lying in the wreckage, an obvious trap, but the Jedi trigger it anyway, so much for their force powers being able to perceive threats. Skywalker and Windu manage to survive the explosion thanks to the older Jedi's quick thinking, but now they're both trapped beneath the wreckage. Meanwhile, Boba and his team of bounty hunters watch the explosion from afar. They had reached the bridge before the Jedi and taken the surviving crew along with Admiral Killian hostage. These Republic hostages would fetch a good bounty with Count Dooku, and would also serve as bait to draw the Jedi in. So while Bosk watches over the clones, the rest of the bounty hunters head towards the crash site to get the Jedi's bodies. R2-D2, however, manages to reach his master first, but he's unable to remove the debris from on top of him, and instead heads back to the starfighters to call for help. But before he's able to get off planet, the bounty hunters arrive and chase him in Slave 1. They think one of the Jedi is trying to escape. In the ensuing dogfight, R2-D2 manages to escape, but the fighter's communication array is damaged, forcing R2-D2 to enter hyperspace and travel all the way to Coruscant to warn the temple about what was happening. Ahsoka and Plo Koon immediately leave Coruscant and rescue the stranded Jedi just in time. But Mace Windu's ordeal is not over yet. The bounty hunters still have Republic hostages, which they can use as leverage. Their leader, R. Singh, is a ruthless killer and willing to go to extreme lengths to get what she wants. Boba, who is still kind of just an innocent kid, 
finds the whole situation distasteful. The bounty hunters send a transmission and demand that Mace Windu come face them or else they'll execute all of their hostages. To show they're serious, they shoot Commander Pons in the head. Boba is unable to shoot him, but Aurora steps in and does it anyway. Commander Pons had been a veteran of Geonosis and served alongside Mace Windu since the beginning of the war. Now, Windu and Skywalker are still recovering. They're far too injured to go pursue Singh. So Plo Kloon and Ahsoka Tano take over the investigation instead. They travel to the Coruscant underworld in order to find out more information about the whereabouts of Aura Singh. They wander into a cantina and overhear that the bounty hunters had headed to Florm. The pirate Hondo Anaka had built a base on the small planet. Aura had hoped that Hondo would help them out. Unfortunately, the pirate refuses to do so, but does allow Aura to stay at his cantina. Plo Kloon and Ahsoka Tano shortly arrive on the planet and demand that Aura Singh release the hostages. Aura is ready, however, and has the hostages removed from the location. If the Jedi try anything funny, Boss will execute them remotely. The Bounty Hunters are dismayed to find that Plo Kloon and Ahsoka had been sent to recover the hostages instead of Mace Windu. However, Aura and Boba continue on with the plan, but this time around, the Jedi are prepared. Ahsoka comes out of nowhere and disables Aura Singh's comm, disconnecting her from Bosk, and holds her lightsaber at Aura's throat. Boba, meanwhile, has a blaster pointed at Plo Kloon, but the boy is no killer, and the standoff ends in a chaotic scramble. Aura Singh manages to escape, but Boba Fett is not so lucky and is captured by Plo Kloon. Instead of going back to rescue him, Aura just runs away, betraying Boba. Another big blow to the young boy. First, he sees his father get beheaded, and now the closest thing he has to a mentor runs away and betrays him. Boba, now alone and angry, refuses to tell the Jedi where the Republic hostages are being kept. But Hondo ironically convinces Boba to tell the Jedi, claiming it was the honorable thing to do, something his father, Jango, would have done. In many ways, this entire story arc has been more about what Aura Singh wanted rather than what Boba Fett wanted. Whereas Jango was a talented bounty hunter and a feared warrior, Aura Singh was just a murdering psychopath. Boba naturally didn't really approve of her methods. And so, ultimately, Boba does what his father would have done and tells Plo Koon where the hostages are. Meanwhile, Aura Singh has escaped the pirate compound on a speeder bike and is being closely followed by Ahsoka Tano. Plo Koon contacts Ahsoka and tells her that the bounty hunter is trying her best to lead her away from the hostages and gives Ahsoka their real coordinates. Ahsoka arrives just in time to save the Republic hostages and manages to capture Bosk as well. Aura Singh arrives shortly after and escapes in the Slave One, but her victory is short-lived. Ahsoka has managed to damage one of the stabilizers on the ship, sending it spiraling out of control. The Jedi bring Boba back to Coruscant, where the boy finally gets to confront Mace Windu face to face. Although Boba apologizes for destroying the Vander class Star Destroyer and getting a lot of clones killed, he doesn't apologize for trying to kill Windu. After all, the Jedi had killed his father. I'm not really sure what Mace Windu is thinking at this time, but it's most likely something along the lines of, next time I kill a crazy bounty hunter, I'm going to make sure I take out his family as well. Which is a lesson we could all learn from. I'm just joking. Murder is terrible, and none of you should go out there and commit murder because it's a bad thing to do. Chapter 11, Mandalorian Economic Crisis. In this episode, we must once again return to the Mandalore system where the neutral world is dangerously floating in the turbulent sea that is the Clone Wars. Two episodes ago, we looked at the ongoing power struggle between Satine Kryze's New Mandalorians and pre Vizsla's Death Watch. For now, Satine has managed to hold off an attempt by the Death Watch to take over the government, along with a Republic plan to intervene in the war, which would have ended Mandalore's neutrality. But now, an economic crisis threatens to do what the Death Watch and the Republic could not do. Because of ongoing skirmishes and battles in nearby systems, Mandalore space, located on the edge of the Outer Rim, finds itself isolated from major trade routes. Mandalore has been ravaged over the centuries by constant warfare and pollution, and was incapable of sustaining life without imports from other systems. The only shipments making it through the war zones now were coming from smugglers who were not only charging exorbitant and predatory prices, the quality of the supplies, a lot of them meant for consumption, was also suspect. Satine Kryze once again approaches allies in the Republic Senate for help. 
A stable trade route needs to be opened and maintained, and Mandalore needs the Republic Navy to do it. Senator Padme Amidala arrives as the Republic's envoy and is pleasantly surprised by the planet's welcome. Many of the citizens of their capital city, Sundari, have lined the streets in order to welcome her to the planet, partly out of respect and probably also out of desperation. At the same time, Moog and smugglers arrive in the cargo docks of Sundari. While you should never judge a human by their appearance, we are all complicated individuals with unique souls. Aliens, however, should always be judged by their appearance, and the Mugans clearly look like scumbags. They actually hail from a mid-rim world which was allied with the Commerce Guild and Separatist Alliance. They've been contacted by Mandalorian officials to smuggle basic supplies to the planet. This current shipment mainly consisted of tea powder. The Mugans, who, as we have established before, should never be trusted, kind of look similar to the Pike Syndicate. So it's fitting that they are adding a chemical known as Slabin to the tea. Slabin is a diluting agent, which is non-toxic, but if too much is ingested, it can cause severe illnesses and even death. By diluting the teas, however, the Mugans can double their profits. The incident, strangely enough, echoes similar scandals here on Earth, like when Chinese dairy companies added a type of plastic filler to baby formula and powdered milk to pad their own profits, killing several babies and hospitalizing tens of thousands more. Meanwhile, back at the palace, Padme's appearance does little to solve the back and forth fighting amongst the Mandalorian ruling council. It's difficult for them to accept the situation they were now in. The black market is their only source for supplies and much of the Mandalorian's anger is directed at the Republic, who through their war and corruption are to blame for the current crisis. The next day, Satine takes Padme to a newly opened hospital to give her more of a view of her new Mandalore. But their inspection is quickly interrupted when several children turn up sick in the hospital. They've been poisoned by some unknown chemical. The children are all from the same school, so something from their cafeteria is the main culprit for the poisoning. While Prime Minister Almec points at Death Watch as the culprits, Satine Howard does not believe it is them. It's not in their MO to attack children. Amidst all of the uncertainty and political infighting, Satine finally has something she can focus all of her attention to. She, along with Padme and the Royal Guard, seek to find out who exactly is responsible for the poisoning. Her investigation leads them to the school where the sick children came from. The medical team from the hospital has already inspected the food the children were consuming and have found nothing off. But a third party vendor also supplied the school with bottled tea drinks, and now the medical team was in the process of checking them out. This, of course, is the same tea that the Mugans were smuggling in with the diluting agent. When Satine questions the superintendent about where the tea is coming from, he attempts to escape but is captured. He confesses he's taken bribes and kickbacks for allowing the tainted tea into the school system. An importer named Sadiq from the shipping company was the one who had contacted the superintendent. Sadiq leads Satine and her investigation to the Mugan smugglers, who were arriving with another shipment later that night. Satine, Padme, and the Royal Guards go and investigate what is happening and see a corrupt customs official take a bribe from the Mugans that night. The next day, Satine grills the captain of the police and asks how it's possible for something like this to happen. The captain denies any wrongdoing is happening under his watch, but does agree to go to the docks with the Duchess to find out exactly what is happening there. When they arrive, they strangely find one warehouse being guarded by corrupt, unmarked Mandalorian police, who the captain abruptly knocks out. He's a no-nonsense kind of guy. When they enter the warehouse, they find the Mugans preparing their next toxic tea mixture, and quickly both sides drop what they're doing and engage in a firefight. Padme gets a few kills, and they arrest the conspirators. Satine tells the captain to burn down the warehouse along with all of the evidence inside it for some reason. And what's even more strange is that the police seem to be carrying flamethrowers in their squad cars. Not really sure why the police would need such weapons, but hey, they're Mandalorians, right? Back to why Satine burns all the evidence. I doubt that she's a part of this scheme, but maybe she doesn't trust anyone in her government or her police to handle all of this contraband. Maybe she just wants to destroy it so no one else can get their hands on it. Before Padme leaves, though, Satine requests that the Jedi send an undercover Jedi to infiltrate the Mandalorian Academy and try to figure out where all the corruption is coming from. The Temple responds by sending Anakin Skywalker along with Ahsoka Tano. Anakin needs to go back to the front, but Ahsoka will join the Mandalorian Academy and help instruct the next generation of Mandalorian cadets in how to deal with corruption and 
corrupt officials. Because of the recent problems Master Obi-Wan Kenobi had caused on planets, no off-worlders were allowed to carry weapons on Mandalore anymore. This meant a Jedi like Ahsoka must give up her lightsaber. Ahsoka immediately starts teaching at the Academy. She instructs the young Mandalorians on how important it is for society to keep its own politicians in check and, if necessary, report them and remove them from positions of power. Ahsoka is basically creating revolutionaries. Probably not the best thing to teach young kids. Later that night, the kids at the Academy are forced to endure another food shortage. During their study session, they begin connecting the dots. There were plenty of ships coming into port, but somehow there was still a food shortage. Something didn't add up. Ahsoka's lesson had inspired the young cadets to do their own investigation, and so they head down to the warehouse to see if there actually was a food shortage. The young Mandalorians are quite resourceful and are able to hack through some heavily guarded government doors. Inside, they find more than enough food to feed the entire planet. They also witness a meeting between unmarked Mandalorian officers and some sketchy-looking individuals, including a few Godel. The kids use a holocam to record the meeting, but one of them accidentally drops a laptop exposing their position and forcing them to escape. One of the cadets luckily is the nephew of Satine Cries, and they bring their evidence to her the next morning. Satine is strangely elusive and warns the cadets to be careful and stay out of trouble. So instead, the cadets approach the Prime Minister for help. The Prime Minister tells the cadets to bring the holocam recordings along with all the cadets who had witnessed the meeting to him. Luckily for the cadets, they also let their instructor Ahsoka Tano know about this secret meeting, because it turns out to be a trap. Instead of finding the Prime Minister waiting there for them, the cadets find themselves trapped by this same unmarked policeman they'd seen the night before. But before they can arrest the kids, Ahsoka comes out of nowhere and knocks out the corrupt police officers. Ahsoka takes a look at the hollow recording and analyzes one of the masked figures. It's none other than the Prime Minister. He's a trader who's been holding all the supplies back and increasing food prices. The cadets and Ahsoka rush to Satine's residence and only find her dead guards there. Someone has taken the Duchess. Ahsoka decides the best course of action is to confront the Prime Minister and pretend to be on his side. She brings the young cadets as a false peace offering and tells the Prime Minister that she suspects they are behind a conspiracy to bring him down. The Prime Minister has the cadets arrested and locked away and lets Ahsoka know that Duchess Satine is also under arrest. Ahsoka thinks she's tricked the Prime Minister and heads to Satine's cell in order to free her, but unfortunately she's fallen into a trap. The Prime Minister's men are trained against Jedi mind tricks and were just playing along with her to see what her true intentions were. Ahsoka is stunned and arrested, and the cadets are brought out of their cells as leverage. The Prime Minister now needs a signature from Satine Christ for a confession of treason. But before that can happen, a scuffle occurs as Ahsoka breaks free, and along with the cadets, they are able to overpower the Prime Minister and his guards. The crisis is averted, and Satine Christ once again regains control of the planet. The Prime Minister is arrested. This is the second time in just a few weeks that Mandalore has almost fallen into chaos, this time from the Duchess's own Prime Minister. There's something clearly wrong with this planet, and it's clearly a sign of Satine's inability to rule. I'm not really sure Republic intervention at this point in time is a bad idea. It might be exactly what the planet needs at this point. So there you have it, guys. Mandalore is again pulled back from the brink of collapse and chaos. Satine Crisis' pacifist government clearly is not strong enough to face external and internal threats. Chapter 12, Battle of Kamina. Kamino represents more than just a strategic target for the Separatists, it's also the homeworld of every clone trooper in the Grand Army of the Republic. While in Legends in the latter years of the war, the Republic builds alternative cloning facilities on other planets, in canon, there was only ever one location where the cloning took place, and that was on Kamino. I always found this kind of strange and a strategic liability. First, if you're engaged in a galaxy-wide war, why only have one cloning facility? With a growing and training time of almost a decade, it'll take more than one planet to produce enough clone troopers for the entire GAR. In Legends, Palpatine actually experimented with the Spartan cloning facilities. Sure, they oftentimes went crazy and started shooting friendlies and were far less capable than the Kaminoan clones, but they only took one year to grow. And as good and stable as a Kaminoan clone was, it would be pretty hard for one of them to kill nine or ten Sparti clones. Then there's the strategic liability of having only one place that supplies your entire army with troops. Therefore, it comes to no surprise that the Separatists are constantly trying to find a way to take out Kamino. 
In the first year of the war, General Grievous attempted to take out Rishi Moon Listening Post, which guards one of the only approaches to the Kaminoan facility. Luckily, a group of rookie clone troopers from Domino Squad, along with Captain Rex and Commander Cody, were able to blow up the outpost and warn Kamino of the incoming invasion. Grievous's fleet was intercepted and forced to turn back. Now, in general, the average Separatist ship of the line is a lot less powerful than the average Republic ship of the line, which would be the Venator-class Star Destroyer. A Venator-class, with its huge complement of starfighters, could usually hold its own against multiple Munificent-class star frigates, despite being almost the same size. This design choice reflects the JR's decision to use highly trained clones instead of cheap battle droids deployed by the Separatists. This meant that the Separatists were all about misdirection and overwhelming the enemy with excessive numbers. This is also why the Separatists oftentimes tried to attack more places than the Republic could defend. The problem with Kamino was that a Republic fleet was permanently assigned to the planet and therefore a Separatist fleet large enough to take Kamino out would be relatively hard to hide from Republic scouts. So they'll have to come up with a more creative solution. General Skywalker and Kenobi along with the 501st intercepted a transmission from General Grievous to Assange Ventress. Kamino is their next target, and this will be a very personal battle for the JAR. The Jedi generals decide to reinforce Kamino and also warn General Shakti that an invasion is coming. Asajj and Grievous are both assigned on the mission to attack Kamino. Grievous commands the bulk of the forces, but Asajj has her own secret mission, obtain a sample of the FET DNA for Separatist scientists. Now, the two Separatist leaders are loyal to the cause and Dooku, but they're pretty wary of each other and competitive as well. While Grievous arrives above Kamino at the front of a large Separatist fleet, Asajj already has inserted onto the planet aboard a Trident-class aquatic assault vehicle. Kenobi and Skywalker arrive on board an Acclimator-class assault ship with the 501st and reinforce the ground troops on Tipica City. Hopefully the blockade in orbit will hold and the fighting will never reach the ground. The cloning center isn't the most durable place and any battle that happens on it could cause irreversible damage to the cloning process. With their troops delivered, Anakin joins the massive Kamino defense fleet made up of a dozen Venator class Star Destroyers. The Separatists arrive with their own fleet of 11 Munificent class Star Frigates, three Recusant class Destroyers, and Gravis' Providence class Dreadnought. An impressive fleet, but probably not enough to break the Republic blockade, which also is reinforced by ground-based starfighters. Before the Separatist fleet can get close enough to the Republic fleet to exchange broadside attacks, the Republic Starfighter Command launches its own strafing attacks on the Separatist fleet. Led by Anakin in a Delta-7 Aether Sprite Interceptor, a sortie of Y-Wings, ARC-170s, and V-19s make quick work of the Separatist forces and quickly debris from the Separatist ships begin raining down onto the planet. Upon closer inspection, the debris seems to be separating from the ship by a controlled explosion, almost as if the Separatists had purposely designed this debris to fall off their ships. The Jedi commanders also notice that Grievous is sacrificing his frigates almost on purpose. Something isn't right. As the Republic Navy begins finishing off the Separatist fleet in orbit, General Kenobi decides to inspect the debris that has been falling into Kamino's oceans. While underwater, he spots several aqua droids assembling the debris into assault ships. This was the Separatist plan all along. They knew they couldn't challenge the Republic blockade in space. But if they're able to launch a ground evasion, then they can reach the cloning facilities, and even the smallest battle in the vicinity of those cloning facilities will cause a lot of death and destruction, including a lot of wasted time, because again, these clones take nine to 10 years to fully mature. The last thing the GRR wanted was any fighting on their fragile cloning platforms. Kenobi manages to escape just in time to see the first Trident assault ships leap out of the water and latch onto Typica City and begin drilling through its roof. The breaching ability of these ships is what really makes them dangerous, and especially terrifying in space where breaching means exposure to vacuum. In the case of Typica City, these Trident-class assault ships allow the Separatist droids to avoid pre-built defenses and create their own entry points. The clone troopers inside the buildings just have to wait and try their best to guess where the droids will come from. Soon, droids begin swarming into buildings from all directions, making a deadly crossfire for the defenders. Slowly, the clone troopers begin falling back. It should also be noted that the aqua droids were far better combatants than the standard B-1 battle droids. As the battle continues, the debris begins falling within the cloning center, wiping out entire generations of clone fetuses. Both General Grievous and Assange Ventures arrive with their assault forces and begin pushing against the last pockets of clone defenders. Things kind of look grim. One bright spot in the clone defense is Clone Trooper 5's in Echo, veterans of the Rishi Moon battle. 
They were assigned to create a sniper position overlooking one of the main bridges connecting Typica City. Although they were under heavy fire, they somehow managed to hold their own. Although the clone defense was quickly failing all across the city, the Separatist droids still didn't have enough droids to take over the entire city. And most of their assault landers were concentrated on one area near the main DNA chamber. General Kenobi correctly guesses that's what the Separatists are after, and sends Anakin to go and defend the DNA chamber. This is where Anakin finds Asajj Ventress breaking into the vault. Ventress was well versed in Form 2 Mikasi, a dueling form taught to her by Dooku. The Count had used it successfully against Anakin during the Battle of Geonosis. But Asajj isn't quite at Dooku's level, and Anakin has improved much since he lost his arm against Dooku, and quickly Asajj finds herself on defensive, trying to escape with the FET DNA. Meanwhile, General Grievous faces off with Obi-Wan Kenobi. The cyborg's multiple limbs and lightsabers give him the upper hand initially against Kenobi, but the Jedi's force powers proved to be too much for him. And as we all know, the reason Grievous has survived so many battles is because he always knows when to run away. Nearby, a group of clones link up with a group of clone cadets. The Separatist droids have made it all the way into the barracks, and they have nowhere to run now. They raid a nearby armory and put together a quick defense in one of the cadets' sleeping areas. While the older clone troopers hold position on the ground level, the clone cadets are waiting to ambush the droids from above in the sleeping pods. It's an exposed position, but ultimately a good gamble, as the droids are easily destroyed in the crossfire between the two groups of clones. Meanwhile, outside of Typica City, the clone advance is gradually starting to slow down. Republic anti-tank teams with rocket launchers begin taking down the Trident-class assault ships. Reinforcements from other parts of the city arrive and begin pushing the droids back. Asajj has managed to escape out of the DNA chamber. Before she can make a clean escape, she loses the FET DNA and is cornered by a group of clones and General Skywalker. But before Anakin can execute her, Grievous comes out of nowhere and scoops her up. The battle is over and the Republic is once again victorious. The Separatists fail to get the FET DNA and the damage to the cloning facilities is minimal. Echoes and Fives prove themselves in combat and are promoted by Captain Rex and become ARC Troopers. The Separatists took a big gamble during this battle. They had a very concentrated assault, which was pretty creative in their defense, and it almost did succeed. But unfortunately, when the clones are fighting with home field advantage, especially on their home planet, it's very hard to defeat them, as witnessed with the clone cadets, Fives, Echoes, and Captain Rex. Chapter 13, Blockade of Pantora. Pantora is home to the Pantorans. On a scale of Thrawn to the Blue Savages from Avatar, they lie somewhere in between. Mainly due to the fact that the creator George Lucas himself plays a Pantoran in Episode 3. Located in the Outer Rim territories, Pantora was a moon orbiting the larger frigid planet of Ordo Plutonia. Pantora was loyal to the Republic, but that didn't stop the Separatists a year before from creating a small outpost on Ordo Plutonia. Previously thought to be completely uninhabited, a race of abominable snowmen known as the Talls actually had been living on the planet for many generations. A three way conflict had erupted between the Pantorans. Talls and the Separatists. Luckily, Republic mediators and clone troopers ultimately stepped in and helped reestablish peace on the planet. A part of the new agreement would be that the Talls would now serve as guardians for Oto Plutonia and keep watch for any future Separatist outposts. It's a setback for the Confederacy of Independent Systems, and they must find another way to gain control over the system. So, a year later, Count Dooku tries to coerce the Pantorans into joining the Separatist Alliance by using economic power. If you look at the physical location of Pantora, it literally is on the edge of the galaxy at the end of a pretty sparsely used hyperspace lane. The planet really didn't have any strategic purpose, and prior to the Clone Wars, it was more or less forgotten by the Republic and the Core Worlds. Small outer rim worlds like Pantora heavily depended on regional trade and commerce guilds like the Trade Federation for everything from transportation, basic food, supplies, raw materials, and even defense from piracy. The Outer Rim was turned into a special economic zone by the Republic in order to entice organizations like the Trade Federation to invest money to build infrastructure there. In return, they didn't have to pay any taxes while doing business in this part of the galaxy, which prior to this was pretty much empty. One of the underlying causes of the Clone Wars was the Republic's decision to rein in control of the area from the Trade Federation, who argued that the Republic had no presence there and really didn't do much to support these Outer Rim worlds in the first place. But now with the war in full swing, every colony or planet that is threatened by the Separatists must be countered by the Republic. And that's because if more member states begin to realize that the Republic is incapable of protecting them, then a domino effect will happen where more and more states will leave the Republic. 
The Trade Federation was technically aligned with the Republic, but it was obviously playing both sides of the war. And on behalf of Count Dooku, it decides to blockade Pantora over dubious claims that it had excessive amounts of debt. Unrest begins to grow on Pantora as basic supplies begin running out. And of course, Count Dooku appears with the promise of aid and breaking the blockade in exchange for Pantora leaving the Republic and joining the Separatists. Things do not look great. Now, during the Ordo Plutonia crisis with the Tals a year earlier, the former chairman was a bit of a madman and was skewered by a spear. His replacement was none other than Baron Notoluski Papanoida, a playwright famous for his galactic epics. And yes, this was the character in the live action version that was played by George Lucas. Baron Papanita sends Senator Ryo Chuchi to the Republic to ask for aid and force the Trade Federation to stop its blockade. You have probably noticed by now this is basically the same tactic the Trade Federation used a decade ago over Naboo. Senator Chuchi accuses Senator Dodd of the Trade Federation of being aligned with the Separatists. Which, believe it or not, is still up for debate in the Senate. Dodd fires back with the good old Commerce Treaty of 1647, which states that the Trade Federation is neutral during galactic conflicts unless otherwise stated. This way, they can only sell to both sides of a war and profit, profit, profit. After the session in Senate, Senator Padme Amidala approaches Senator Chuchi and promises to support the Pantoran people and urges her not to fall for the Separatist trap. Padme, who had experienced a similar situation during the crisis of Naboo, is an expert with dealing with the Trade Federation. Though Senator Chuchi claims that the Pantorans would never betray the Republic, things are beginning to look dire on Pantora as more and more locals begin rallying against the government and demanding that they join the Separatists. In order to observe the Senate's decision, Baron Papanoida has also arrived on Coruscant along with his son Ion and his daughters Che Amanawe and Chi Ikwe, who of course are modeled after Lucas's actual children. Probably should have left them at home because Count Dooku is also very desperate to have the Pantorans join the Separatist Alliance. He's desperate enough to try to kidnap the Baron's daughters. It seems like the Republic Senate will rule in favor of the Pantorans, so now he needs an extra bargaining chip. When Chi and Che enter their Coruscant apartment, they find the lights turned off. Chi is captured immediately by kidnappers, and Che puts up a bit more of a fight and manages to strike one of the intruders with a small statue before she is stunned. It makes sense because Che is modeled off of Amanda Lucas, who actually used to fight professionally in the MMA. Padme Amidala finds out the next day about the kidnapping. She was worried something like this would happen. She also happened to be with Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano when she finds out and asks the Jedi to help the Baron find out who the kidnappers were. The local police are pretty terrible at their jobs. But Anakin reminds the Senator that the Jedi can't really be involved. This is more in the local police's jurisdiction. But I guess going to Tatooine and slaughtering an entire village of Tusken Raiders is completely within the Jedi's jurisdiction too, right? Luckily, Anakin Skywalker is willing to bend some rules and sends his Padawan Ahsoka Tano to go aid Senator Chuchi. The two also happen to be pretty good friends. The two decide to head back to Pantora. Ahsoka suspects that the sisters are being held on the blockade above the planet. Meanwhile, the Baron and Ion go back to the apartment and search for clues. The local police, who again were terrible, missed an obvious clue, the statue that Che had used to bash one of the intruders over the head with. The Baron finds some green blood on the bottom of it, quickly scans it with his data pad, and finds out that it belongs to a Rodian, and not just any Rodian, but the one who shot second. The information says that Greedo is based on Tatooine, which is where the Baron and Ion quickly head. Meanwhile, on board a Trade Federation ship, a part of the blockade over Pantora, Senator Chuchi and Ahsoka, who is disguised as a servant, are greeted by a Trade Federation administrator. Chuchi dangles the possibility of Pantora joining the Separatist Alliance and suggests that negotiations over terms begin. This gives them perfect cover to stay aboard and sneak around and figure out what the hell is going on. Later that night, they sneak into the administrator's office and overhear him speaking with the captain about the current situation. The captain objects to the kidnapping of the Baron's daughter, especially the part where she's being held on his ship. Now all Chuchi needs to do is find out where she is. The two head towards the detention area on the ship, unaware that the administrator is watching them. Luckily, Ahsoka is there with her lightsaber, and when she finds Che, she easily dispatches the guards. On the way out to the detention area, Ahsoka runs into another squad of super battle droids led by the administrator and takes them out as well. Before she can turn her blade on the administrator, though, the ship captain arrives with his own guards. The captain claims to know nothing of the kidnapping, creating a relatively awkward situation. Senator Chuchi quickly takes advantage of the situation and offers to forget about the whole kidnapping as long as he withdraws the blockade. The captain of the Trade Federation ship, who never really agreed to the kidnapping, withdraws his forces from orbit. 
Meanwhile, back on course on Senator Lotdot announces to the Senate that he is dismayed to find that a separatist infiltrator had orchestrated a kidnapping of the Jedi and Senator Chuchi. It's a strong attempt to distance the Trade Federation from Newt Gunray and his pro-separatist faction. But ultimately, it allows Trade Federation to deal with basically whoever they want. It also keeps Pantor free for now. Meanwhile, Baron Papa Nuita and Ion have arrived on Tatooine and go directly to Jabba's palace and request the services of Greedo. This should immediately raise red flags. Greedo is a terrible bounty hunter and criminal. Anyone stuck with hiring him is probably very desperate. One of Greedo's girls lets Greedo know about the Pantorans looking for him. Greedo correctly guesses that the Baron is here about the kidnapping and moves quickly to silence him. Greedo and his thugs surprise the Baron and Ion and take them captive. But Papa Nuita is not just the playwright, he's also a badass and quickly turns the tables on Greedo and pulls a knife on him and brings him in front of Jabba for an audience. The Baron appeals to Jabba, who also is a father. The Pantoran doesn't want any trouble, he just wants his daughter and then he'll go home. So Jabba makes Greedo show the Baron where exactly he's hidden his daughter. The Rodian takes him to a sketchy bar in Mos Eisley full of armed thugs. Luckily, the Pantorans are all pretty capable fighters and they manage to overwhelm the thugs. Ion gets a few kills in, but again, it's the Baron who goes ham on the thugs and whips out two blasters and goes John Wick mode. Mission complete, and the Pantorans are free once again, and the sisters are back home. As you can see, the Separatists have many different ways to influence colonies and worlds, and they're really not above doing things like kidnapping or blackmailing other factions. It's pretty rough out there, especially on the outer edge of the Outer Rim. Chapter 14, Hut Prison Break. 21 BBY is almost over, and the Senate's Military Budget Committee is about to meet once again. Warhawks in the Senate are pushing for increased military spending and increasing the size of the GAR. The Separatist push in the Outer Rim was now barely being contained by the Grand Army of the Republic, and they were still greatly outnumbered by the Separatist droid army. However, with the Republic teetering on the edge of bankruptcy and disruption to many domestic programs, some senators like Padme Amidala are wary of increasing spending and increasing the size of the clone army. The Runin Senator Ang holds the deciding vote in the Military Oversight Budget Committee, and Padme is throwing a party with the intention of trying to persuade Ang to support her faction. Unfortunately, the Runin species were kind of a pain in the ass. They were incredibly picky about even the smallest details, and any deviation from what they expected could be perceived as a huge insult. Look, I understand when you're in a very diverse community, you have to alter your own cultural expectations so you can meet other people kind of halfway. Here on Earth, it's relatively easy to do because after all, we're all the same race, the human race, and there's really no excuse to not be accepting of one another. But aliens like the Ruin are extremely annoying to deal with, and their cultural norms are so different from ours, I don't think it's really necessary for humans to have to put up with their nonsense. They should kind of just suck it up. Anyway, Padme doesn't really have that choice. She needs everything to be perfect at the upcoming party, or Ong might not agree to support her. Padme is really stressed out about this whole arrangement because, well, party planning is a horrible task that I wouldn't wish on the worst of my enemies. The banquet will be happening later that evening, and it seems like a garnish for the centerpiece dessert item, a joking fruit cake, is missing. This apparently is Senator Ong's favorite dish, so C3PO and R2D2 venture out into the city to grab the missing ingredient, fresh joking fruit. But apparently these two droids are basically incapable of such a complicated task. The droids venture to the market, get ripped off by a fruit vendor who overcharges them. Instead of costing one credit per fruit, the vendor charges them eight credits. On their way back, a droid approaches R2-D2 and C-3PO. You might recognize him as Toto-360, Cad Bane's droid that blew itself up inside the Jedi Temple. Apparently, he was rebuilt. Anyway, Toto suggests to R2-D2 and C-3PO that they need some maintenance done, and perhaps a soak in an oil bath will do the trick. After all, these droids saw more combat in action than your average droids. The offer is too enticing for R2-D2 and he immediately goes for a bath. While C-3PO is yelling at R2-D2 to come back, a convertible speeder comes out of nowhere and grabs the protocol droid and flies him straight to Cad Bane. You see, the devious Duros bounty hunter is at it again. This time he's been hired by Jabba the Hutt. The crime lord wants him to steal floor plans for the Senate building. 
something that could be found in a protocol droid that belongs to a Republic senator. So while R2-D2 is getting buffed and massaged and oiled down, C-3PO is getting tasered, restrained, and hooked up to a diagnostic machine that extracts the info that Cad Bane needs from him. I don't know why they constantly are shocking him. You'd think they could just hook him up to a USB cord. Unfortunately for Cad Bane, C-3PO does not have anything useful in his memory banks. But C-3PO does mention that R2-D2 is the one with the blueprints for the Senate building. So the bounty hunters go back and grab R2-D2 instead. The little astromech is a lot harder to grab, but they eventually do capture him so Bane can finally extract the blueprints. Once Bane gets the blueprints, he immediately sends them off to Jabba the Hutt. Meanwhile, he memory wipes the droids and returns them back to the market. No one is the wiser about the abduction, and the droids bring back the Jogan fruit just in time for Senator Ong to sample the dessert. Meanwhile, on Tatooine, Jabba pays Bane for the job and immediately offers him another job. You see, the reason why he needs the blueprints for the Senate building is that he needs to release a hut named Zero from Republic Prison. He has some very dangerous information on the Hut Council that the Huts don't want falling into the hands of the Republic or any of their enemies. The plan that Cad Bane hatches is a daring one. He's not going to directly attack the prison because that would be a suicide mission. Instead, he heads towards the Senate building with the plans he had taken from R2-D2. There, he would take several senators as hostage and use them as a bargaining chip to free Zero the Hut. His team of bounty hunters approaches the landing zone outside the Senate building, and they make quick work of Senate commandos guarding the platform. A key to Bane's plan is Aura Singh, who has set up a sniper position across the street. The Senate commandos are supposed to be selected from the most elite Senate guard, but so far they aren't all that impressive. Just a year ago, Captain Argus of the Senate commandos betrayed the Republic for a large sum of money in return for freeing Newt Gunray, who at the time was on his way to Coruscant for trial. The Senate commandos guarding the Senate were no different and quickly overwhelmed. The Senate building should have been a hard target, prepared to withstand a crazy battle. After all, the galaxy was at war still. Probably should have let the clones take lead in planning security for the building. Cad had also brought along with him two separate commando droids, and he has them put on Senate commando armor to maintain their cover on the landing dock, while the rest of his squad heads into the building. Meanwhile, in the upper floors of the building, Padme is putting in some last minute work on her bill for the military oversight committee, while Anakin is trying to convince her to take a break and go on vacation with him. To prove just how much he loves her, Anakin gives Padme his lightsaber, his most important tool. But before he can grab it back from her, Senator Organa enters and asks for Padme to join him in the lobby to discuss the enhanced privacy bill. While this happens, Cad Bane casually walks into the Senate building, throws a detonator into a guard's barracks, and disables the security system. After they are finished neutralizing the Senate building's defenses, the bounty hunters join the Senator in the lobby and kidnap them. To show how serious Bane is about the whole ordeal, he shoots a Grand Senator in the back when he arrogantly tries to walk away. Stupid Grand, just because you're one of the oldest species in the galaxy doesn't mean you're better than everyone else. Bane contacts Palpatine and lets him know he's taken over the east wing of the Senate building and gives the Republic his terms. He wants Zero the Hut or else he'll continue killing even more Senators. Bane then shuts down the power to the entire building, putting it on lockdown. He also shuts down all the comms and doors. Everything seems to be going according to plan. Well, except for the fact that Anakin Skywalker is still trapped in the building. He doesn't have a lightsaber, but he still has the Force, and for now, he must red dawn the intruders in any way possible. Anakin's first goal is to somehow turn the power back on and contact the outside world for reinforcements. But before he can do that, he gets shocked and knocked out. Meanwhile, Babatine agrees to Bane's demand and is processing Zero's release from prison. Bane secures the hut and engages a laser grid tripwire system attached to explosives around the senators and escapes from the Senate building. Clone troopers finally arrive to secure the Senate. They're already too late and needlessly smash through the window of Palpatine's office. Be assured the Chancellor will probably reassign some of them to Felucia or some other high casualty rate front. This is a very embarrassing incident for the Republic. They need to retrieve Zero to discourage future colonels from doing something similar. The Jedi Council assign Obi-Wan Kenobi and Jedi Master Quinlan Vos to the mission. Vos is an interesting choice. He does have extensive knowledge and experience with the galaxy's criminal underworld but he's also a pretty disobedient and free-thinking Jedi. Basically, he's the opposite of Obi-Wan Kenobi, not the best pairing. The two Jedi head to Nell Hutta to question the Hutt Council on the whereabouts of Zero the Hutt. It's pretty obvious that they were the ones behind the audacious plan. 
But the Republic must be careful not to hurt relations between the Hutt and the Republic. In the first year of the war, the Republic went through great lengths to secure the right to use Hutt space for transferring military supplies and troops. Its position in the Adarim made them strategically very important for the entire war. Fortunately, Vols has an interesting power known as Psychrometrics. This allows Force users to touch certain items and sense individuals who have touched or used them before. Using a cup in the room, Voss senses that Zero had drunk out of it just before they arrived. Unbeknownst to the Huts, who were indeed holding onto the criminal, Zero had just run off with the singer's size snoodles after sensing that his life was in danger. You see, all that information Zero had access to about the Hunt Council was actually hidden in a diary, a diary that would be released to the public if anything happened to him. This information was stored in a location that only Zero knew, and Zero and Snoodles had run off to hide in the swamps of Zero's mother, Mama the Hut, who provided the two with a starship so that he could run off to Teth, where he had stored the diary. When the Huts find out about Zero's disappearance, they send for Cad Bane the Bounty Hunter once again to fetch him back. And both the Bounty Hunter and Jedi manage to follow Zero's trail to Teth. Zero had hidden the diary in his father's grave, but as he retrieves it, Science Noodles betrays him and shoots him for the information. When the Jedi arrive, they come face to face with Cad Bane, and the bounty hunter barely is able to get away. In the end, it's Noodles who returns the Hollow Diary to her true master, Jabba the Hutt. And so ends the story of Zero the Hutt. So, as you guys can see, in the second year of the Clone Wars, the Republic is better able to counteract all of the Separatist Alliance offenses in the Outer Rim. As the Clone Army and the Grand Army of the Republic grows larger, so does Palpatine's influence and power in the government. And this is all a part of his plan to use the Separatist Alliance crisis as a way to grab more executive power so that he could eventually turn the Republic into an empire. At the same time, the Jedi are becoming spread thinner and thinner across the Outer Rim, which of course makes them easier to pick off once Order 66 is launched. Palpatine, as usual, is in complete control. Anyway guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on our other coverage and our coverage of the seventh season of The Clone Wars. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.